Hi, welcome to the DC Marvel Battlecast, where we discuss all things DC and Marvel related, and we debate who would win in versus battle matchups. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. The song at the beginning was Fox on the Run by The Sweet from the album Desolation Boulevard, which is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you buy or stream music. And it's also on our Spotify playlist now. Yeah, go ahead and and, uh, do a search on Spotify for DC Marvel Battlecast, all one word. And uh, you'll, you'll find, find us there. our playlist there. We, we have a, a DC playlist, a movie theme playlist, a, a Marvel movie theme playlist, and uh, a playlist containing the songs that we play at the beginning of these podcasts. Right. All right. Um, you can subscribe to us, to this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever. You, you know where you listen to this podcast. Yeah, wherever you listen to this podcast, you can probably subscribe to it. <laughs> um, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at DC Marvel Battle, or you can email us at DC Marvel Battlecast at gmail.com. If you want to reach out to us, message us. Just send chat. Us, just chat, you know. Just tell us how your day was. What's going on? <laughs> or send us any uh, Battlecast requests. Yeah. Uh, this episode, we're not doing a Battlecast. We are reviewing Ant-Man, which uh, will be later on in the episode with our good friend uh, Adam Spees. Yep, yep. He's a fellow comic book nerd. Uh, that we used to work with, and uh, he has a lot of great insights on on just comics in general, and we thought he'd be a great guest for this particular review. So look forward to that. Yeah. Before that, we're going to go into uh, some news. Really, again, uh, slow news. News. uh, It's just the holidays, I guess. If anyone ever questions why this is a bi-weekly podcast as opposed to a weekly podcast, it's because there was no news. If we if for the, right. for the last week, right. if we right. had done it last week, well, all the news that that we're talking about, pretty much for the most part, came out this past week. I, I've noticed that like uh, like the week after we do a podcast, there's like zero news, and then right. everything comes out like at the last minute, right before that we we record our podcast. I'm always panicking, like oh my <laughs> gosh, there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> but this week we're going to talk about the new Guardians of the Galaxy trailer, which just came out. Right. We're going to talk about um, some new Fox. Uh, Marvel film dates um, and uh, discuss a storyboard animatic that came out for the New Mutants. We're going to talk about uh, a new release date for Aquaman as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the Lego Batman movie and the new poster that came out and some casting. Uh, and some there's some like art around the Spider-Man uh, and photography, uh, art and pho- photography around Spider-Man, uh, Black Panther, and Thor Ragnarok that we're going to discuss. And then we're going to cap that off with uh, a discussion about the, the four-part DC TV CW invasion crossover, which was really dope. Was there Black Panther art? Did I miss that? Well, well, uh, Sebe- Sebastian Stan, the Winter Soldier, is probably going to be in, in Black Panther next, right? Uh, that I consider that more in, in, well, Infinity War art, actually. But oh, we'll talk okay. about that later. <laughs> Never mind then. We'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> Let's start with the Guardians of the Galaxy trailer. So that released... Uh, Last night, uh, during well, actually we released online before they showed it during the championship, some sports, championship. some sports I, thing. I don't know some, what it is. Some sports ball. They did the sports ball. Actually, it was college football. It was the uh, a- ACC ACC championship. ACC, that's yeah. right. Okay. So or AAC. I don't know. I feel dumb now. I follow the Broncos. <laughs> I don't follow college football. But um, so the 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 new trailer looks fantastic. Uh, pretty much on the same vein as the it previous. It does trailers. look good. It looks like uh, the new the new cameras they're using. I guess the uh, the the footage. The red. Yeah, the, the cinematography. I think looks really good. I think yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I think it looks. As, <laughs> you, you I, I never really cared about the cinematography. Like uh, the black levels. Apparently, that video that came out that was talking about how Marvel doesn't use correct black levels. I'm like, you know what? I can still see what's going on. You could you can increase the black levels. I don't think it'll increase my enjoyment of the film anymore. I, but. Uh, the, yeah. uh, you know, if they're switching cameras, all the more power to them. Um, I think this trailer, like so many people that I didn't even know were fans of the Guardians of the of Guardians of the Galaxy on my Facebook feed, all of a sudden are like posting this video talking about Baby Groot, uh, Guardians of the yeah. Galaxy. Like yeah. it's already like the hype level is real. All right, as much as I like Baby Groot and Rocket Raccoon and stuff like that, I feel like people need to calm down. I mean, like, Marvel has you around, they're twisted around their little finger over right. your love for Baby Groot. That's right. Baby Groot like, is come awesome. Come on. Come on. Yeah, he, my, he's my... cute, but it can't be that easy to, to you know, win your heart or your <laughs> attention or whatever. One of my friends said, I didn't know how much I needed Baby Groot in my life until right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, getting a lot of attention. He was super cute. I am Groot. <laughs> I am Groot. 
I like his little reaction when uh, Rocket's explaining the death button to him. And he's like, yeah. do not push this button. We will all die. Maybe <laughs> good. And he's like, <gasps> kind of like a guess like that. But, of but the, of course. His big, big black eyes. Yeah. Um, the the preview itself starts off with them facing down the, I think James Gunn called it an abelisk. It's that big giant tentacle monster. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that and in the concept art. Yeah, it's like breathing out this like it's it's like fire, but it's like rainbow colored kind of. Yeah, that was weird. It's pretty cool looking. I, I heard that was actually like the the start of the film. Like they get hired to take that creature out. Yeah, so. I heard that as well. Um, but yeah, a- after they're facing that down and and uh, man, that 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 scene where where Drax is like jumping into the mouth of the of the. Uh, the abelisk. That's a good shot. Yeah, it's a pretty cool shot. And I'm guessing that he, he's inside the abelisk when we <laughs> see that one shot later on where <laughs> he's like, it looks like he's in the stomach. stomach of something yeah, like that. It's like a yellow yeah. stomach and he's like stabbing it over and over again. That's pretty funny. Crazy Drax. Drax is cr- insane. Okay, cracks me up. <laughs> um, is it just me or does he seem like twice insane in this movie as he did in the first one? I don't know. <laughs> oh, from the like the previous footage where he's like, you just need to find someone who's pathetic. Like, like you. you. <laughs> yeah, they've been crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love the scene between Rocket and, and, and Baby Groot. Um, uh, I laughed out loud. Yeah. I don't know anybody that didn't laugh out loud for that. I, especially I, the same time he was yeah, like, explain it to me. He, he was like, I am Groot. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. Yes. I am Groot. Right? Okay. I am Groot. <laughs> no, no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I no, laughed I, out loud. My, my part, favorite part was like, uh, who's, uh, does anybody have any tape? <laughs> I gotta put it over the death button. <laughs> you tell me nobody has any tape. That's, that's me, like... Every few months in my house, whenever I'm looking for the tape. <laughs> Actually, I was looking for tape yesterday in my house. That exact scene, it was before the trailer, too. It was kind of psychic. Um, I was looking for duct tape because I couldn't find the limp brush. So, anyway. I felt like uh, Gamora didn't really have too much. Like, she didn't s- have a single line in this trailer or the previous one. No, she did not. It's like, why? Why? She's why a woman that? a few words, I guess. I don't know. I suppose. Um, Mantis spoke. That was cool. Yeah, that was cool to see. Who's the actress who plays her? Don't ask me to pronounce it. It's like Palm Clementif, I want to say. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm... she looks like she's gonna really pull off Mantis. She she like, acts very alien like. Yeah. Like the way she like pronounces her words and everything like that. Yeah. She she yeah. looks pretty spot on. Like. Totally. This is a, her, the first time we've seen her. Uh, we saw her in some concept art and everything like that, but. So we knew vague, vaguely what she was going to look like, but I'm really uh, happy, pleased with how, I how she was green the character. in the comics, though. She, um, she have we discussed this? She before? was uh, flesh colored before she was green. Okay. Um, in the comics, she became green later. I guess that makes on. sense because we have Gamora and she's green. Yeah, Gamora is green, so you don't want to have you know two green. Just because you might Diversif- get confused, I don't know. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but like, had- character-wise, she seems like just from like her voice and like the, her demeanor, like really sweet and yeah, and and uh, innocent. They they couldn't be more opposite. Yeah, it looks like she has her empathy powers in the film. I don't know if she'll have that. Like- was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you, you feel love okay. yes a general senseless love for all humanity no, or all selfless love <laughs> selfless yeah yeah and she's like no sexual love for her <laughs> what no <laughs> and the and the, and the reaction. reaction it's yeah. just like <sighs> just cracks up that was great. you must be so embarrassed and he's so dumb do me do me <laughs> what an idiot yeah it's it's pretty good uh, I don't know if she'll have like her her plant powers because I, I think in an earlier podcast i hypothesized last time we were talking about mantis that maybe she would be the one to make baby group grow into big group by the end of the film mm-hmm. now i'm thinking we may not even get to see adult group again i wouldn't this, be surprised film. if if baby group is like a hit and people are like squee every time they see him uh-huh. it's yeah I, w- I would imagine they're gonna take their time with that they're yeah gonna be in no rush is it still Vin Diesel doing his voice? It is, isn't yes. it? Yes, it is. All right. They must just chipmunk his voice or something. It sounds pretty good. Yeah. He does a good job in in making it sound more young. He's a good actor. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that... Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. I, I guess. What? No? It doesn't even need to be him. I mean, no, I could do it. No, but they probably pay him a lot of money to do it, so... Uh, pay me that a lot of money to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm looking. F- I'm looking forward to this film. This makes me more. I liked this one way more than I liked the previous one. Uh, the the oh the, the teaser sneak the sneak preview peek, or whatever it was called. I thought that was pretty good. It was. 
it could, reused the didn't song. Really get but... me like excited for the. This one gets me excited for the film. Yeah. Um, and this isn't like one of those cases where like, oh, this is all I need to see. I, I want to see more. I I, I I like these characters. So you want to see more mm-hmm. marketing? More marketing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. More marketing is always good for Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Just because they can afford to, the, the some of the concepts within the films are so spacey and out there mm-hmm. that you can kind of you can still show a lot and still be cryptic like I think that's how it worked for the last movie I still had no idea what the film was about for the most part yeah even though it was not too complicated of a plot but right right um so I, I think maybe we'll see teenage Groot in the Infinity War films and or then maybe Groot. and then maybe we'll see adult Groot back in the third Guardians movie. I don't know. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Cool. Um, all right. I think is that, that takes us to the end of that, that, that preview. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so next is the... Do you want to go into the animatic first? Let's go into the, the New Mutants animatic. Okay. Sure. Um, last week, a, an, an animatic, it was a storyboard animatic, um, which is about a um, minute and a half long, um, came it's, out... It was a ex- uh, coming soon dot net exclusive. Yes, um, coming soon dot net, and basically it showed it was an, it was a storyboard animatic of the new mutants fighting the demon bear from the demon bear storyline uh, that the new mutants had back in the eighties. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, what's her name? Denny Moonstar, Moonstar, Moon Glow. Uh, I thought it was magic. Uh no. Okay, so Moonstar, the demon bear is Denny Moonstar's parents well they're like possessed by the demon bear spirit and so the demon bear is going after her she's a native american uh and i guess it's a native american demon spirit um and so like she ends up getting hospitalized in in the battle in the comics and that's the way the story goes and then they they fight to although by this time i can't remember if magic is yeah magic is part of the the movements in the comics by this time but in the animatic we see magic Going up against the demon bear, she has Lockheed on her shoulder. Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah, um, I don't know how they're gonna. Maybe they're gonna rationalize Lockheed as being like a creature from Limbo or something like that. Magic because is Colossus's magic uh, yes. daughter. No, no sister. Sister. Magic is Colossus's Colossus's sister. Her name is Ileana Rasputin, and um, uh, she's basically the ruler of Limbo. That's her mutant power. Gonna. Well, I, is she a mutant? She is a mutant. Or is it magic? It's she both. has something called a soul sword. I know that. Yeah, that's kind of like the manifestation of her power, and it, it hurts like magic beings, which the demon bear certainly is. Uh, there's a shot though where she like leaps over the demon bear and hits it. Yeah, that was, this was whole like, animatic I felt it was like really weird. It was a little rough. Well, yeah. I mean, the music did a good job of kind of setting the vibe that they were going for, but like c- c- some of the dialogue, like. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And then she repeats it. Yeah, and then she says it again after she cuts him. I do notice that when she hits the bear with the sword, you see, like, the landscape turns, like, hellish for a split second. Yeah, it was weird. And I don't know if that was, like, Limbo, or... I don't, I, like, I don't know too much about the magic character, and I might have to do some reading on her. I don't know her. anything about any of these characters. The, the demon bear, or any, Yeah, so this whole thing was just, like, bizarre, yeah. kind of, like, surreal to me. They're not my favorite... I was like, what is going favorite? on? x-men characters they're actually probably my least favorite but that might just because i've done the least amount of reading of the only one i really recognized was lockheed and like i i know and a cannonball i guess cannonball isn't it yeah i I know that lockheed used to belong to shadow cat right yeah uh kitty pride um he was a alien dragon that belonged to kitty pride but now i'm guessing my theory is that the lockheed is from limbo since he belongs to magic in this animatic um, also in the storyboards were Cannonball, Sam Guthrie, who can like, he can create a force field and, and, you know, fly real fast. He's kind of invincible. Ooh, he's he just like a really fast flying force field, right? Yeah. Something like that. Mm-hmm. There's plows into people basically. And, uh, his, it's energy based. It is. Okay. All right. Um, there's, I, th- oh, I saw Wolfsbane. I think she was the one that was pushing Moonstar in the hospital bed. I'm guessing that this takes place after right. Moonstar got, gets hurt by uh, the the demon bear. Um, Wolfsbane can turn into a wolf and werewolf. Werewolf, essentially. yeah. Well, she can turn into like a half human, half wolf, and she can turn all the way wolf, and she can still talk to the group through Moonstar, who has the ability to like talk to animals, and she can uh, create like illusions, and she has like these psychic arrows things that she shoots. That's a weird power set. Yeah, a little bit. They're they're all kind of a little 
different, I guess. Um, I don't know if, like, uh, if uh, Sunspot is going to be in this film, because he was in Days of Future Past, uh, fighting the Sentinels. Uh, Uh, Fox will do it. They're really like, eh, who gives a shit? Just for kids. Who cares? (laughs) It's just continuity. Whatever. (laughs) Um, I think, uh, I don't know if, like, Warlock or Cypher are going to be in this. That might make a good story for the sequel, their, their whole thing. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. So Warlock is like this techno or, or techno organic being, uh, I believe he's an alien and Cypher was this, um, he was a new mutant who was able to communicate in any language, including with machines and stuff like that. And they became friends. Cypher ends up dying. And Spoiler alert. Warlock ends up saving him and they kind of become one. So yeah, that, I think that would be, make a pretty good story cause it was pretty emotional, but, um, I don't know. It looks interesting. It looks completely different than any other X-Men film. Um, it, it doesn't even look relatively in the same universe, but that might be a good thing at this point because uh, apparently they're wanting to reboot the whole time, the whole universe. I do think it's interesting that like there is sort of a connection between uh, magic and like the you know Deadpool's Colossus. I wonder if they like they'll reuse that CGI Colossus. Oh, maybe just to like tie in the universes. If you were going to, that would be the way to do it. Yeah. I wonder if this movie will tie into the Legion TV show at all. If they'll be part of the same universe. I thought they said they weren't going to do that. Yeah, but they kind of backtracked on that. Like they said, you you will see some references in the Legion show. I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't think they know what the hell's going on. <laughs> because you, you they said, no, this isn't going to be part of the X-Men universe. And they said, oh, no, you're going to see references. And then now they're going to you know retool the whole universe. So I don't know if those references are still going to be in. Or what the hell's gonna happen? They're Fox, just they're just come they're on. just they're just making it up as they go. They're just making it, it up as literally. they go. Literally, no plan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I mean I liked it. I, I'd be interested in seeing it just because it I is Marvel like related. It. And that was weird. You didn't like it? No, I didn't like the dialogue. Like it, there was the the other corny dialogue where he's like, "What are you gonna do?" He's like, "I can only do one thing, but I do it really hard." <laughs> It's like, Ugh, it's like, who's writing this what dialogue? <laughs> what is this one thing yeah, you to do? Like Cannonball said that. Yeah, so, dumb. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, I think that there's a lot of excitement that this built up among the fan base. Really? I think so. That's my general impression from the things that I've read. People are like, oh, cool. So, yeah. not me. I don't know. It is not like the same level as like the animatic that was leaked for... Uh, Deadpool, like but just that, like that no- put fans in like a frenzy, and, and like people were like, all yeah. the websites were like, tell yeah. Fox to make this movie and everything like that. Yeah. This is not the case for this. Well, no one knows these characters. I mean, huh. well, I wouldn't say no one knows these characters. Mostly, no one. You don't know, so I, you I assume that no. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I consider myself a pretty big comics fan, and I know of the New Mutants, and I know like generally who these characters are for the most part Mm -hmm. sort of Mm -hmm. but not really okay i don't know i don't know how to attack well like (laughs) i just don't care about them the majority of the populace i I would say didn't know much about like ant-man or anything or or guardians of the galaxy so it's possible to make a good movie out of lesser known characters like i don't think you know anything about guardians of the galaxy no i didn't so so there you go shut up No, I think that. Or you just shut your mouth about things you don't understand. <laughs> nice Spider-Man quote, <laughs> <laughs> Harry Osborn. Um, okay, on to the next news then. Yeah. Oh, the uh, so there's new release dates for like a whole bunch of. Oh yeah, Fox, I forgot to go into films. that. So okay, so uh, Fox has announced two new film dates for their Marvel properties. Uh, one of them being um, December. Oh, I'm sorry, November second, twenty eighteen. And February fourteenth, Valentine's Day, uh, twenty nineteen. Um, so, the 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 twenty eighteen d- date, the on November second, that will be the third, their third Marvel date that they have in twenty eighteen, because they already have March second, twenty eighteen. I'm assuming that might be where the New Mutants might go, mm-hmm. um, or Deadpool. Uh, the next date is June 29th, twenty ninth, twenty eighteen. So a few months later, I have a feeling like that one's more likely to be Deadpool in the summer. Just, yeah, it's because it's a it's a more uh, I guess box office friendly date. Yeah. So they probably want to put their bigger their bigger film there. Yeah, yeah. 
So it was March 2nd, June 29th, and now November 2nd. So that's three dates. What the third one's going to be, I have no idea. Maybe X-Force, maybe Gambit. Maybe they'll finally get Gambit off the ground. And as far as the the, the February 14th one, that's anybody's guess. Yeah. I have I, no idea what that could be. I have a feeling that's would most likely, I mean, especially if it starts Channing Tatum. I mean, the girls are going to be like, yeah, let's go see Channing Tatum on Valentine's Day or something like that. Oh, man, that's a good I don't know theory. So, yeah, I guess, so they have five dates announced between 2018 and 2019. I'm guessing those, one, wait, one, two, three, four. actually four, I'm sorry, New four. Mutants, Deadpool 2, X-Force, Gambit. That's what I'm guessing. In that order? That, Not necessarily. That, I think that order makes sense. Does it? Just because, yeah, you have New Mutants and then you have Deadpool, which should set up X-Force. I'm just surprised that's going to be in the same year. I'm surprised they're, they're announcing this many movies. Like, I feel like Fox always, like... Or we're going to do all these things, and then, like, if only 50% of their plans come to fruition. Like Gambit. We were supposed to have Gambit like, this year. Yeah, we were supposed to have Gambit on October. We are supposed to, you know, be have Gambit months ago, and that never happened. Huh. So you never know what, ha- what might happen in the future. Yeah. Well, DC uh, pushed back Aquaman from uh, that, yeah. July 27th to eight, uh, 2018 to October 5th, 2018, which... What does that mean? I, okay. Um, I know... They're talking about pushing back Flash. I'm really surprised they're pushing black, pushing back Aquaman. Yeah, they're um, not going to have I, any summer movies. Because I, I knew they had the October 5th um, spot open. I totally thought that was going to be Ben Affleck's Batman. Uh-huh. Because, it, like, I don't know, it's close to Halloween. This is supposed to be focused on Arkham Asylum. I thought it was going to be kind of dark. Kind of made sense to do it near, you know, a, a dark holiday. Right. So I'm kind of sad... Although, I mean, James Wan has some, you know, a good uh, past uh, success why am I October. Why am I horrified that the next bit of news we're going to get about Aquaman is that James Wan has left Aquaman? Shut your mouth. Why would you say that? It's like Rick Famuyiwa left. Famuyiwa left no, The Flash. No. Now they're pushing back Aquaman. What's happening? No, James Wan is not leaving Aquaman. He's, like, said so many things about... He, he knows how to, how to work... Uh, with the studio, with these franchises. He did Does it he? really well with Fast and the Furious, um, especially with, like, Paul Walker's death and stuff. He, you know, he did a really good job with that. Um, and, and he he keeps talking about Aquaman. So he, there's he, he's more outspoken about Aquaman than any of the other, like, directors are talking about their characters right now. Mm-hmm. So I don't think he's going to leave. Um, I think he wants this and, and kind of needs this. Um this will put him like up, just to like the next tier of great, uh, or good like reliable directors. Are you so. sure Fast and the Furious didn't already do that? Mm, Fast and Furious. I I think, um, Fast and the Furious. I I think it's it's becoming like a big franchise. Um, but I mean, uh, it's one of the high. It was like one of the highest grossing films. Yeah, last that year. film. But how much of that was due to Paul Walker? Who can, uh, who can say? I who can mm, say? I don't know. I mean, I think be, because of that film, like I mean, it's now like a big franchise. So I, I think not uh, just because of that film, because of the two prior films as well. True, it's been growing. True, I I don't know. I think I still think he needs this though. Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure what they're gonna do with the July 27th date now. Um, so that's disappointing. I I hope. I hope we're still going to get two films in 2018. Um, so, yeah, that's that. That's that. Uh, the B- Lego Batman movie comes out in February. Yes, the Lego Batman comes out in February. They just released a new poster, uh, which is insane. There's so many characters in this poster. Um, I was trying to, like, name all of them to see if I could, but there's, like, four characters, there's four women characters. I have no idea who they are. I'm guessing it's, like, either Vicky Vale or, like, uh, Dr. Leslie, what is your name? Leslie Tompkins or Talia or Renee Montoya, something. Mm-hmm. Maybe all of those are correct. I don't know. It looks. But, I uh, saw a Batman Beyond villain in the background. It looks like Blight because he's like a green glowing skeleton. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I can't tell if the penguin is riding. Is I don't know if that's Killer Croc. Yeah. Well, he looks like a crocodile. So. Yeah. Or if it was just I don't know some like museum dinosaur skeleton thing i don't know 
Just because, I don't know, in the Arkham, that's what initially I thought it was. Really? Yeah, because he, like, he owns a museum or works no, at a museum in the Arkham games. I it's Code Rock. Yeah, you're probably right. It just looks so different from the Suicide Squad version, so that kind of throws me off. Yeah. I mean, you take a look at Bane, and he's wearing his jacket from The Dark Knight Rises, yeah. which is interesting. Does Bane wear that jacket a lot in the comics? Now? No. No? <laughs> no. Huh. Um, and I then, hate that jacket. Like, there's a whole bunch of different homages like Bane, like uh, the the biggest one, the biggest news one, of course, is Billy D. Williams is finally gets to be Two Face. Yeah, and they made him look like Billy D. Williams too. Right. So that's gonna be great. Well, they also they made him look like the Billy D. Williams if he was Two Face's Joker because the 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 dark side of his face, the like the evil side, is pink, like how it was portrayed in Batman Forever. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it portrayed that like pink. In, in any other medium besides yeah besides Batman Forever so if if any listeners don't don't remember uh, Billy D Williams played Harvey Dent in the very first Batman movie the Tim Burton 80, uh, 1989 Batman movie when I was younger Lando I Calrissian I, yeah I didn't understand that that reference I didn't realize that hey this guy becomes Two Face down the road uh-huh. so. When Tommy Lee Jones uh, kind of like became, I said that weird, Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> when Tommy Lee Jones became um, uh, Two Face and Batman Forever, um, I guess, yeah, that was, they, they, they switched up the character. It was like a new universe now. So it was, I don't know, kind of weird. Um, I feel like the universe of Batman Forever and Batman and Robin is definitely not the same universe as, as the, the first Burton two Burton films. films. The Schumacher yeah. universe. Yeah. Schumacher universe. <laughs> Um, the Shumi universe. But yeah, there's there's a ton of characters in here. It's really awesome. You see uh, a pretty cool looking Mister Freeze, and like what you see a mutant from the Dark Knight Returns, the Frank Miller comic. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Hugo Strange has a weird Lego beard. <laughs> the Penguin looks weird. Penguin looks like uh, he looks like Danny DeVito. Penguin kind of. Yeah, yeah. Like they're they're borrowing from that. He's like pale skinned. You know, uh, he doesn't have a big nose because like you know a monocle and umbrella and top hat. Stuff like that. Yeah, so they're definitely paying homage to all the Batman films that have come before. Yeah. Well, I mean, and even the, sh- the like the old 60s TV show, because Batgirl's costume is, is purple, purple and, yeah. and yellow. That's pretty cool. Um, that is cool. That is really cool. Um, but yeah, uh, they, uh, of course, have a whole bunch of Justice League members too, which is nice. Green Lantern, Superman. I really want to know if Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum are coming back for those roles. Probably. Because I loved the end of Lego movie. They probably are. Hopefully, they better... Um, Martian Manhunter's in there, and it's his old, like, costume. It's not like the full, like, blue bodysuit that we see, like, in Supergirl right now. Yeah, and with the alien head. Yeah, alien yes. Alien shape head. So that's head. unfortunate, because that's my favorite version of Martian Manhunter's costume. Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks like they're also going with, like, an Eartha Kit Catwoman, I think. Oh, are they? I didn't even see that. I think. She's dark-skinned a little bit, so. A little bit. I can't tell. Interesting. Clayface looks like he's gonna be like really like interesting because like he's just like a like a he's just a massive Legos. a massive Legos yeah which is appropriate for the character. I didn't realize until this poster that the Lego Batman movie like logo like the bat symbol mm-hmm. is like borrowing from the the Nolan the Nolan symbol. Is it? Let me see. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's it's like the, it's the flat, like flat on the top wings. Yeah, yeah. On top. What about yeah. on his chest? No, it's not. It's the you know the it's, classic it's the eighty nine eighty nine or actually the eighty nine one had like it was different. The one he has here uh, was made popular by Batman Returns. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll so. just trust you on that. <laughs> At least on the costume. So. All right, on to Spider Man. So over at the the this Brazilian event. Um, called the CCXP. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, what is, is it? Is it like a, a convention? It seems like a convention, like an E3 slash Comic-Con or something like that um, event in Brazil. They, they they showed a clip from the Spider-Man Homecoming, like, or it was, like a, it was more like a, it was a promo footage. reel, I guess. Yeah. yeah footage. Um, and spoiler alert, I guess. Would you consider this a spoiler? Uh, no, I, I don't it's think not, so. It's not plot You, you know they're going to spoil it in like the yeah. trailers and stuff. Right. So we all know that uh, Happy Hogan, played by John John Favreau, who directed the first two Iron Man movies, um, we already uh, had received reports that he was going to make an appearance in the Spider-Man Homecoming movie. The footage that they showed kind of spoiled it as being that he is going to deliver an upgraded costume to Peter Parker 
from Tony Stark. Yeah. Um, and the upgraded costume, people have said it may, it looks like like the yeah, well, the Iron Spider thing, but there are conflicting reports yeah, on that. Yeah, there's no confirmation that... I hope it doesn't look like Iron Spider, because I don't think they should go that route just now. Not yet. I want yeah. to see... So, basically, what's, what's cool about the costume is that it has the web armpits. Yeah, the... Uh, which the allow arm, him to glide. Armpit hair wings. Yeah, they, they, they're they functional in this film in that they allow him to glide to better fight the vulture who can fly. Yeah. Um, why do they don't... Why it just doesn't have repulsor flying boots, I don't right? know. <laughs> well, why don't Iron Man just give him a, a you know, well, an Iron Spider suit? Yeah, Iron, Iron Man kind of, kind of like that customizes flies. everything to be true to the comics. <laughs> it's like, oh, you but, can't be as cool as me. You can't have you can't have all the powers I have. Um, you, you have a spider theme going, we'll, we'll just give you some web armpits so you can glide. <laughs> I don't know, it's yeah. weird decision he makes. Yeah. Decisions he makes. Um, I think that's really cool. Uh, I've always I, been a fan of the style, uh, of the arm, web armpit style, I guess. Um, like, not necessarily like the weird netting version that they had in the De- Ditko era. But uh, when they got rid of it, like, in the 90s, I was a little disappointed because it seemed just like a unique part of his costume. And, and the way they did it, like, in the Straczynski run, the art by... Um, Ramita? Not not Ramita, the cover artist. Campbell? Oh, uh, yeah, Campbell. Yeah. J. Scott Campbell. J. Scott Campbell. I think the way he did the web armpits is kind of, like, very strandy, like, thin, not very netty, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to explain it. But you'll just it was like a, like a membrane kind of like yeah. Thin it membrane. was really cool looking. I think I, I like the web armpits. Always been a fan. Every time I draw Spider Man the character, I always draw him with the web armpits because that's just how it is in my brain. Hmm. But the fact that they they made him functional here, um, and the the fact that they're even getting included is awesome. I, I'm hoping they they're not there all the time though. I'm hoping like he maybe like clicks his like wrists to his belt or something like that, and then puts his arm out, and then like that's how it's connected when he needs to glide. Yeah, I think that would like make that. sense. It's, yeah. it's sort of like, um, did you ever see How to Train Your Dragon 2? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, like okay, how also he, that thing that he has. Yeah, yeah. that like how he does the same suit thing. kind of thing. Yeah, how he like uh, reaches down, hooks some glove apparatus to like his belt, which like unzips this, yeah, squirrel suit, yeah. essentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I don't, I don't think you need it to be retractable, I think, because um, <clears throat> when he moves his arms around, you don't want it like folding in on itself and yeah. stuff you know yeah, yeah so it needs to be retractable in some way that's the only thing i can think of is if it's it's like that it's it's cool that they're like really going back to like because like the the raimi films and like amazing spider-man 2 at least like it really looked like spider-man but even when you see it went to civil war it was like it was uh like ditko's spider-man you have like yeah, the thicker the big, the lenses, thick lenses and yeah. then you have and now you're getting his uh you know his his glider web what are we calling it web glider i call it web pits web i think people are calling them web wings web wings there we go that's what i'm going with <laughs> um so that's that's cool let's it's we're seeing things that we've never seen before when i thought you have almost seen everything with spider-man on film yeah there's so still this surprises made, to be I, I forgot about that yeah between the the web wings and and you know the spider signal and everything yeah, like yeah. that see i'm interested in seeing how that works because it has some kind of interface and stuff so yeah It'll be pretty cool. Yeah, when I so when I heard about this, I was I was super like like oh yeah, he totally has that. Let's see that on film. There was I don't think his I'm really hoping again his costume isn't like the Iron Spider, but there was that uh, poster. I forgot like I don't even know where it was being. Uh, it was it was like a it was like a billboard. Oh, it was in Brazil, mm-hmm. and it it was uh, the new Spider Man logo, but it was very like uh tech looking yeah like it definitely wasn't you know when you have the spider-man homecoming uh title treatment you have like the spider-man face Mm -hmm. underneath homecoming and it's like totally not that it's you know it's like a hexagonal kind of um spider logo i like it yeah i think think it looks really cool cool. i think it's i think it makes sense in in this uh universe where you have tony stark being the manufacturer of the costumes I'm hoping he's not the designer necessarily. Like I'm hoping that at least the the web pits are are Parker's design, mm-hmm. and but he just doesn't have like the funding. That would be really cool if like Peter Parker, like Iron Man, isn't too involved with his costume or anything like that. But he lets uh, Peter Parker like work in his lab and design stuff, yeah. and then Happy Hogan just happened to deliver whatever he was building. Yeah, something like that. I think that'd be the best way to go. Yeah, for sure. Because. Yeah, you got to show that that Parker is intelligent and a scientist and yes. engineer on his own. Yeah. Um, so they, there was also they also revealed in the footage that they showed that um, 
Spider-Man will be visiting Washington, D.C. Um, because yeah. there's a shot, they say, where he leaps off of the Washington Monument, and that's when he activates his web wings. Yeah. Um, interesting. Because I'm Spider-Man's guessing a very much of a, he's very much a New York character. Right. And I'm guessing, like, this is going to be, you know, a field trip. There are not, like, any skyscrapers in D.C. Um, that's true. He, that's probably why he I needs went a the, glider. Yeah, I've only been there once. But, yeah, it would make sense why he would need a glider in D.C. Everything's really spread apart. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, not necessarily spread apart, but just not very tall either. But, yeah, around the Washington Monument especially, there's nothing big around it. Yeah. So. Um, that's why it always makes sense to have the character in New York. Right. Because of the skyscrapers. Yeah. Anywhere else. Spider-Man is... would kind of suck at fighting crime in, in Kansas or something. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was interesting. Um, uh, I guess that's it for that news. Well, did the Thor Ragnarok uh, promo art also come from Brazil? It did. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, moving on to to, to the Thor Ragnarok promo art, uh, we get to see his and the Hulk's gladiatorial designs. Um, yeah, and which you finally get to see Thor in his helmet. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not the same helmet. It's it's not the one that he wore at the beginning of the first Thor movie with the feathers and everything. But like it's still that. quintessentially like Thor. It still looks enough like it, it. It looks like a gladiatorial version of that helmet, pretty much. Like if like if Maximus's helmet from the Gladiator <laughs> movie um, had a baby with Thor's helmet from the first Thor movie, this is what it would look like, pretty much. Which is awesome. I want that helmet. <laughs> uh, he's not holding Mjolnir. Um, Which, yeah, that's in the super arts. surprising. He has two swords. I mean, like, which it, makes sense because he'd be able to kick everybody's ass with Mjolnir. Well, it's like in, in the first movie when he didn't have Mjolnir, he didn't have his strength. He didn't have his powers. He was mortal. Right. So is that the same case here? No. I think he'll still have his strength and powers and everything because he doesn't derive his strength from Mjolnir. But what they did in the first Thor movie was that Odin just took Odin him. made him mortal, basically. Hmm. That's why he was able to be killed so easily by the Destroyer, if you remember. Right. Uh, so I'm guessing, yeah, he still has his strength and everything, but he doesn't have Mjolnir. I don't know how he lost it. Be interesting to figure that out. Yeah. But he's. I'm, like... I'm guessing the. Uh, uh, what is the Grandmaster? Is probably like holding a hostage or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. So it's cool to see Thor like just being a badass with swords. Yeah, kind of what they, like what they did to Iron Man in Iron Man Three is they kind of stripped him of, like he was out of the suit for a long time in Iron Man Three. And he had to kind of be resourceful with like all those gadgets from Home Depot and everything mm-hmm. like that because he blew up all his armors. Do you remember that? He went to Home Depot and he, he like made like an electrical glove and everything like that. And that's how he like, he made like a he filled like ornaments with like explosives. Do you remember this? Oh yeah, I never saw Iron Man three because he oh. was a piece of crap. <laughs> you never saw Iron Man three? No. Okay, so there's a scene in there where he spoiler he, alert. he blows up all his armors and um, he needs to infiltrate the Mandarin compound. So he pays a visit to Home Depot and kind of creates all these like genius little gadgets he's like little gadget man like literally home it, depot like product placement home depot no just oh, okay place like home depot okay, okay. or Lowe's or whatever so uh so yeah it, actually that was probably one of the best scenes in that movie um when he had to get inventive um so it looks like they're doing the same thing in this movie where they're kind of like stripping him of mjolnir and kind of leaving him to be a little bit more resourceful mm-hmm. but at least now he has the hulk on his team, on his side. Captain America doesn't have his shield. Thor doesn't right. have his hammer. What, what's going to happen in Infinity War? Well, I'm sure he'll have it back by then. Yeah. Hulk looks awesome. He looks straight out of Planet Hulk. Oh, yeah. Same helmet. I like that hammer that he has. That big, huge thing that's as big as a you know a block engine. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited. It's really colorful. Definitely looks to be a different style than any other Thor movie. I'm not sure if that's just... Ref- reflective of the art that they art style they chose to go with in this poster or, mm-hmm. or if it's reflective of any type of art style that we'll see in the actual film yeah because promo art it tends to be like kind of stylized sometimes right especially but, especially like in foreign countries that being said it, it is it is it matches pretty well with the logo that they chose to go with that's true that's um, true like so, the rock and roll logo yeah like the 80s video game logo yeah yeah <laughs> uh or 80s like rock band logo yeah heavy metal band logo so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, going back to the shield thing that you mentioned, the last little tidbit of news that we got um, uh, from this past week uh, is a photo that Sebastian Stan 
posted on his Instagram. This might be news. This might not be news. It's it's un- yeah. unclear if if it, if this was like a hint at, of things to come, or if it was just a gift, a gift to that, the actor, to the actor. Yeah, but but basically he had he was wearing a shield, that was Captain America's shield design, but minus the color, except for the star in the middle, which is red. So right. it, it's it's a uh, reminiscent of his his Winter Soldier arm. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. With the red star on the shoulder. Um, so now, that, you don't think this is from Black Panther? Because where else would he get a vibranium shield? Uh, okay, so he definitely got the shield. If if this is legit, he definitely gets the shields from Black Panther. Or maybe not. Okay, so th- there are several options that could happen here. So if this is legit, maybe they, they create a new shield for him. Black Panther creates a new shield for him to help him fight. Right. The other option is Because his arm was ripped off. The other option is that it's given to... It's the original Cap shield, just recolored, given to him by Tony Stark, who has the shield at the end of Civil War. Uh-huh. Um, the reason he would give it to him, maybe, is because Steve Rogers dies in the Infinity War. And then that's when Bucky takes up the mantle of Captain America, as he did in the comics. Uh-huh. Um... And then maybe at the end of the Infinity War, or in the Infinity War Part 2, Steve Rogers comes back to life. Because we know that Thanos kills half the universe. Uh, Spoiler alert. Well, maybe not necessarily in the movie, but in the comics, in the Infinity Gauntlet storyline, Thanos kills half the universe. Just by, like, snapping his finger, because he has has all the Infinity Stones. Yeah, by snapping his finger. If, yeah, and so if Steve is one of those to go, they'll need a new Captain America, Bucky's there, maybe they give him the shield, and then... After they restore the universe, Steve comes back for, for part two or something like that. That's my guess. Yeah, I wonder if if it is uh, Steve's old shield and, and Bucky gets to keep it. I wonder if they're going to give uh, Steve like the new shield from the comics, like with the energy blade that comes out of it. Oh, yeah. Because I hate that shield. <laughs> Yeah, with the with the little uh, it's the triangle shield with the little energy tip. Yeah, and it, like it splits into two shields. Yeah, it's weird. I don't it know. is weird. Yeah, I hope not. I don't like that one. <laughs> I like to see Cap with his traditional shield. Yeah. Um, but right now in the comics, it's Sam Wilson has it. The Falcon. Cause... What comes out first, Infinity War or Black Panther? I uh, thought it was Black Panther because I I thought they were shooting. Let's see. That Black Panther release date. So they were shooting uh, Black Panther. Uh, they're not shooting Infinity War yet, are they? Uh, they started July oh, really? 6th. Uh, yeah, so actually Infinity War comes out before Black Panther. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So that my, changes my theory yeah, My then. theory might be more correct. Yeah. Yeah, it probably is. But yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it for that news. Three, three little tidbits. You, you got uh, the Thor news, the Spider-Man news, and this uh, Winter Soldier news. Yeah. Pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. On the, yeah, so that's it really for all the movie stuff. But on the TV spectrum... Oh, yeah. We had forgot a about this. huge, huge uh, four-part DC TV CW crossover uh, event on television. And it is the closest thing we've ever come to seeing the Justice League uh, on screen in live action. And it was pretty cool. It wasn't really a four-part series. The the uh, Supergirl didn't tie into the crossover until the very last scene of her episode. Oh, really? the, the rest of her episode was, you know, just about her, what's going on in her storyline in the show right now. Mm-hmm. So um, it really started with the Flash. In that episode, essentially, the setup is uh, the Dominators crash land on Earth. So um, Flash has never encountered these before. Mm-hmm. So he assembles a team. Um, he, he goes to, to Star City, he gets the Team Arrow, he goes, uh, they replay that same episode in Supergirl, uh, where they, they collect Kara and, and he brings her back and then, uh, they, they, uh, start training essentially, which was pretty cool. They trained in this building that looked exactly like the Hall of Justice from the old Super Friends, uh, cartoon. So that was cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was, it was really cool just to see all the characters together and interact and stuff like that. It's, it just makes me really love the, the DC TV universe. Um, who was, who's in charge? Uh, Barry. <laughs> well, it was really Arrow, but uh, there's, there's like this funny bit where uh, 
uh, Oliver said that Barry should be in charge, but Barry had no idea what was going on. So Oliver was just like whispering everything. And then uh, White Canary was like, are we supposed to pretend like we just don't hear Oliver? <laughs> I know. It was pretty funny. Um, but it's, yeah, it's them seeing Supergirl, like there's no other character like Supergirl on any of the other shows. So they're all pretty wowed by her. And that was pretty cool. Pretty neat. Are they, do, Is Supergirl part of the same universe? No, she's part, we learned on this episode, they called her universe, uh, Universe 38, which I think is a call back to the year that Superman was created. Oh. So. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're, the, and they're, Supergirl acts as sort of like a, a, tr- a test training um, person. Sparring dummy, partner. Sparring of? partner for all of them to go against, um, to, to train fighting aliens since she's an alien herself. Mm-hmm. And, uh. So during that segment, like they all it kind of it's kind of revealed to everyone that uh, Barry went back in time and created Flashpoint and like kind of oh, yeah. changed people's lives. Like some of their family members died as a result of that and stuff like that. So oh. they felt like they really couldn't like trust Barry. So when they went off, like they they left him behind or Barry decided to stay behind and, and Oliver decided to stay with him. Um, so. Uh, when they when Supergirl and all the other uh, members went went to go face the the Dominators, they uh, they killed like the, they met the aliens. The aliens uh, killed the president. They kidnapped him, and when they went to go rescue him, they killed him like right in front of them. Oh, wow. It was hardcore. It was like oh shit, just shot, just got real. Hmm. And then right after that, they all got uh, mind controlled uh, with this alien device that the Dominators had. Mm-hmm. So uh, so they go back. And then, so it's like Flash and Arrow against everyone, which is actually like the the, the first scene of the episode was actually started like in media res, like right before like the opening titles, uh-huh. and like it kind of set that scene up, scene up. So right from the get go, like you know the stakes of what's going to happen in this episode. It was pretty crazy, huh. um, but pretty fitting too. It was kind of nice to to see that happen. Um, so did Flash and Arrow hold their own against everybody else? They did. Huh. They did. Uh, like Flash took on like all the metahumans and and Green Arrow took on like all the to a couple of people <laughs> well he, he took in everyone else who just had like essentially weaponry okay um so so it was it was, it was an all right fight the choreography was kind of terrible um this was the flash episode right yeah this was the flash episode okay um and so like yeah you kind of see like the strengths and weaknesses of each show when when like other characters visit other other uh shows and stuff like that and mm-hmm. the flash's choreography definitely is lacking but uh, anyway um, that fight ends when the Flash leads Supergirl back to the alien device. And, like, when she's about to charge him, he, like, turns intangible and she crashes into the machine. So everyone, like, turns back to normal. Oh, cool. Um, but at the end of that episode, uh, like, right when everything is, is normal again, all of a sudden, like, out of nowhere, like, a few, like, characters just get, like, tractor beamed up to this Dominator spaceship. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, shit. Like, Flash, like, runs in slow motion to, like, try and save Arrow but it's like he gets there too late. Um, and, and that leads into the Arrow episode, um, which was the 100th episode. Mm-hmm. They they managed to uh, to work that out so that the 100th episode was part of this crossover. And it was really, it was a really great uh, 100th episode. Like I'd re- the first two uh, segments of this four-part crossover, Supergirl and, and The Flash, mm-hmm. I didn't really care for. Like I was like, eh, this is, a, I don't know if this is going to be that great just because of like, I don't know, the action and the special effects weren't that great in Flash and stuff like that. It was an interesting concept, but I don't know. The 100th episode of Flash was so good. Um, When they got... Uh, Green Arrow, you mean? Oh, what did I say? Of of the Arrow. Yeah, Yeah, of of the Arrow. Because when they got beamed up to the ship, it turns out that, like, they're all in this, uh, like, the Dominators are placating them by putting them in this, like, machine. Sort of like, I don't know, it looked like something from, like, Star Trek and the Borg where, like, they're, like, in mm-hmm. hibernation and they're all, like, sharing this, like, shared, like, virtual, like, reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's essentially, like, what Oliver's life would have been like if he had never become the Arrow. And you really see, like, everything that he's, like, lost and sacrificed and how many loved ones that he's lost. Because they were all there. His Laurel was back from the dead, Black Canary, and, and so were his parents and his friends and stuff like that. It was, like, a really sweet episode. It all centered around, like, him getting... Uh, married to to Laurel, and it's like everything I wanted to see. It was like, yes, finally, huh. you know, uh, they're made for each other. <laughs> and uh, but he like slowly starts to realize, along with everyone else who's like sharing the the uh, the this illusion, this fantasy world that uh, it's not real, and that yeah. they have to try and escape. So it's um, like the it's a wonderful life of Green Arrow. <laughs> 
Kind of. the 100th episode. That's pretty kinda. good. That's it was, good. it was, it, I, yeah, I really love this episode. And, uh, because, uh, also partly because it brings back Deathstroke and it brings back like all the villains from the past seasons in our own. That's like the, the big battle, uh, that happens with, in, in this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, because like their mind is like trying to fight back from them, like getting outside of this, this illusion. Um, so they managed to do that. And meanwhile, back on earth, while, while that part of the show was happening, the other, everyone else was trying to like find them and rescue them from this alien ship. Um, but uh, so when they get the characters that were on the ship break out of this the the fake reality, they hijack they they steal a, a ship and they make their way back to Earth. But they're like uh, about to be uh, taken out and shot down by all these like ships who are chasing after them. Mm-hmm. But the Wave Rider comes in, which is the uh, the uh, Legends of Tomorrow uh, time ship. It's also a, it could go into space and oh, rescues cool. them. So that leads up to. Um, uh, real quick, uh, what are the Dominators' plan? Like, what is their motivation? Oh, um... Like, why were they trying to placate and study Green Arrow and everybody? I can't remember if you, if you learned the answer by this point. Really, the... the uh, you learn throughout, I think, probably the three episodes. I forget exactly when. The Dominators are on Earth um, because of the emergence of um, the Metagene. And they are oh, okay. af- uh, afraid that um, they've seen other worlds where um, metagenes have have uh, been established, and uh, they threaten other worlds. Okay. So they're they're, they're like preventing. Um, they, they essentially want to set off a metagene bomb that's going to kill all the metahumans on Earth. Oh. To prevent them. Does Arrow have a metagene though? No. I think he's just a normal guy. Okay. No. No, only the characters on Flash really do. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's like the whole their whole kind of plan. So in the third episode, uh, they learn that um, the they go back in time because like as the Dominators, we knew about them. The government knew about them beforehand because they visited Earth like in the fifties or something like that. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And so the plan on Legends of Tomorrow was that's the fourth episode, right? Yes, this is the fourth episode. Okay. Is they'll, they'll go back in time. They'll capture um, one of the the dominators back when they knew they they were spotted, mm-hmm. and then like interrogate them, like find out what they what they want. Why why are they on Earth? So yeah, yeah, that's right. This is when they learned their plan essentially. Um, so they the, they managed to get captured by um, uh, government agents in the past. And uh, along with along with one of the Dominators, so while they're all, all in captivity, they uh, they figure out what's going on. Okay. And uh, so they come back. They they escape the government. They come back to the to the future when all the ships are uh, like amassing around the world and about to like uh, invade the world and drop this metagene bomb. So the last the last episode, it's just like this really cool. Everyone's together fighting the Dominators and across the city. And like uh, they drop the meta the meta bomb and like Firestorm goes and he's like trying his hardest to like transmute it into something else. Oh, cool! And it's just the so cool. It's a great, great epic battle. So the, the fourth end. episode was the the best. Yeah, I, I think so. Well, no, the Arrow episode was the best, but this was a really cool, really cool like end fight. You see Supergirl fighting alongside the Flash and Arrow and everyone else, and it just it was. It, Really cool. Is it like Avengers like level of like teamwork and stuff like that? Like, there was definitely teamwork. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't Avengers. It's the closest thing we've uh, we've come to to having like DC characters like a Justice League type um, fight a whole bunch of like aliens like in, in in Avengers. So it was pretty cool. When they go back in time, do they still have like their modern clothing and and their powers and everything like that? Um. Uh, yes. Well, okay. they had their costumes. Yeah. You know, so. I guess. I don't know. Every time I see, like, clips from uh, Legends of Tomorrow, they always, like, disguise themselves or yeah. something to yeah. protect the timeline. But it seems like they were concerned about that in this case or something. Uh, not when they're wearing their costumes. Okay. Yeah. Because the JSA existed at that time. So there were superheroes. And actually, that's why the Dominators came during that time in the past, because of the emergence of the JSA. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, it, and really, so after the battle, you know, they defeat the aliens, they stop the bomb... And you know, then it, they're like they have a party afterwards, and that's the end of, end of the. Is it a part. cool party? I was like, when superheroes <laughs> go to parties, it's pretty hilarious. Actually, there is a scene where like uh, Supergirl was with uh, Ray Palmer, who's played by Brandon Routh, 
and uh, Felicity. And Felicity's like, I feel like I'm looking in a mirror because like they're both like blondes with glasses and they're the same height. Carl, Carl uh, walks away. Supergirl walks away. And then uh, uh, Ray Palmer is like, she looks just like my cousin. Oh, that's like a <laughs> Superman Returns yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah, it's a callback to him playing Superman. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Really cool. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I appreciated it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because he's Superman. Yeah. The 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 four-part crossover ends with uh, them giving uh, Supergirl like uh, a way to communicate with them and, and to uh, go between their worlds, whatever she wants. Oh, so then I thought maybe this would like combine everything. No. No? No. Okay. Yeah. So Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow, and Flash are all part of the same universe. Yes. But Supergirl is not. She's in a different dimension. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But it was, I, I, I loved it. I loved watching it. Again, the first two episodes, I wasn't, like, too thrilled with, especially because Supergirl, it turns out, wasn't part of the four-part crossover, really. Mm-hmm. But after Arrow, such a... If you're a fan of Arrow, um, it it really made up for a lot, I feel like, of, of what they they kind of failed in the past few seasons. So you're back on board with the show now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, after this news. This news actually, all four shows have been really good so far. This season? Yeah, this season. Really. So Supergirl's a lot better on CW than she was on uh cbs i watched a lot of the promos for this invasion crossover and i don't know who she is but she's the blonde with the glasses felicity Fel- is that her yeah she's like best team up ever <laughs> like she squeezed and then like there's another part she's like oh you're gonna go fight aliens how cute yeah and i'm like uh, who's this bitch <laughs> she needs to die like uh, you like you see all this cool superhero stuff in the promos and then all of a sudden you see just like this annoying <laughs> girl uh, like just, it's like, who are you? Yeah. Get out of here. I think you're, half, bu- you're bothering us. Half of all viewers of Arrow probably agree with you. <laughs> she was actually one of the, like, the main reasons I thought of, like, uh, abandoning the show. I can see why. Um, yeah. She's yeah. annoying. Yeah. Just in the promos. I can't imagine a full episode with her. She, she was, she didn't play a big part in the, in the uh, crossover, except for the fourth episode. But even then, like she was sort of more of like a backup to Cisco because they're both kind of like they play the IT like support character like the tech people in okay. their episodes so like Oracle yeah like Oracle exactly cool yeah all right I, is that it for that that seems pretty exciting I might have to check out the, at least that fourth episode I don't think I would appreciate the third as much because I never watched Arrow but I'm interested in, I like team up superhero movies action and stuff like that so yeah yeah I mean I mean if, if Anyone who who has like dropped out of Arrow or is, is not caught up with the episodes, I, I definitely recommend them. Of course, they're spoiled for you now, so why even bother <laughs> watching them? <laughs> I'm sh- sure you still appreciate it. The action yeah. is cool, so yeah. So okay, well that does it for this. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get our our buddy Adam Spees on the line, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and review Ant Man. Let's do it. All right, welcome, Adam. Uh, Adam Spees is a good friend of ours. Uh, we used to all work together um, over mm-hmm. at uh, a website that John, I won't name it because Jonathan still works out there and <laughs> we don't want Tim, you know, he might say some uh, some foolish things. <laughs> yeah, there's um, only gosh, one of the three that still works there. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Right, <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, uh, Adam, uh, we knew him as as a, a equal um, uh, kind of nerd, I guess, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, so it's a big Deadpool fan. Deadpool fan. I think we mentioned you in our Deadpool review you did, um, as being one of the, the bigger Deadpool fans that we knew of. Um, but if, if, if you want to go ahead, go ahead and tell us, uh, how, how did you get into comics or, or uh, superhero movies in general? Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, my brother and I just had a couple of different comics. One of them happened to be, it was a Wolverine comic, Wolverine 88, which has a fantastic cover of Deadpool in silhouette. Uh, basically skewering Wolverine. It's absolutely gorgeous. I highly recommend checking that one out. But that, oh, nice. that comic kind of got me... And, and we had like a, we had one of the Infinity Wars... No, sorry, Infinity Crusades. Uh, a couple other like things here and there. But when, when I went to college, I got into film. And then after film, I just realized that comics are basically just storyboards. And so for people who love movies, it's, That's perfect, true. it's a perfect medium to enjoy comics as well. And so once I moved out to Los Angeles, I just started buying and collecting and reading as many Deadpools as I could, and it got me into other bigger stuff, 
um, and just kind of growing, growing from there. Yeah, I remember uh, this quote from Robert Rodriguez where he was, like, comparing the two mediums. He was saying how similar they were. Mm-hmm. And how, like, it's just essentially just words and pictures. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's perfect for anyone who has that, that, vis- that love for visual medium. Yeah, and Rodriguez definitely used the comic as a storyboard for his yeah. movie. Yeah, uh, I would say <laughs> so. Right. Really. <laughs> um, so, actually, since uh, you, you were talking about Deadpool, what did, real quick, what did you think about that movie? Uh, I love Deadpool. Uh, it absolutely deserved a 4.5 rating from you guys, not a 4. <laughs> um, saying it was the same quality as Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman Unlimited Edition is ridiculous, in my opinion. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> but, um, it, I agree with that. Yeah, it, I'll agree with that. It's not a perfect film, but I thought it was a, a fantastic depiction of Deadpool for the masses. So is it fair to say that Deadpool is your favorite comic book film? Yeah. With, oh, uh, no. Uh, no. Because of my love of film, I might have to say Winter Soldier is my favorite film. Yeah. I think, I think That's it's, one of my favorites, too. Yeah. I think it's actually the best actual movie of all of them. It may not be the most fun, but I think as an actual film, it's probably the best one out there. And then no De- Deadpool is just like Knight? the most fun film. It's kind of like for Dark Knight. Okay, yeah. I see how it is. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> Dark Knight is a fantastic movie as well. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to turn down Dark Knight, but I don't know. I love Winter Soldier. So it sounds like you're a Marvel guy. Without question, I'm a Marvel guy. Awesome. All right, let's wrap this up. Let's uh, <laughs> let's get this. But any, any yeah. love for DC? Yes, love for DC, uh, and the biggest love for DC is when it comes to Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. Um, oh, I okay. love Long, Long Halloween. Halloween. Long Halloween yeah. is is probably my favorite trade paperback period out of everything I've read. Uh, I mean, hmm. all of Batman's graphics and trade paperbacks are probably among the best. But I just, when it comes to the actual universe, Marvel's a better universe because it's grounded in reality. All right, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like this game. All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and get into the to the Ant Man review. Sounds um, good. So we'll, we'll just talk through the plot and, and just, I guess, discuss whatever pops in your head at the moment, and, uh, and that's, that's how we'll do this. Um, so I think overall, uh, the Ant-Man film, uh, it, it reminds me of a lot, a lot of like Guardians of the Galaxy in that Ant-Man is a silly concept, really, for a superhero. Like I remember talking to a lot of people about the film before it came out, and they're like, the fuck, he can control ants? And I'm like, yeah, it's... It's a little bit cooler than it sounds, and actually, I think the movie because made he it, also shrinks. <laughs> I mean, I think the movie made it cooler even than than what I had envisioned it from you know the comics and everything like that. Um, and and now, like you talk to people and and they see that you know controlling ants is a cool super superpower, and and like being able to shrink is a cool superpower, and and, and it's not nearly as as cheesy or corny as as it could have been. Um, Definitely. And I think like Guardians of the Galaxy, which also had some far out concepts, I think it's the lead actor uh, and his charisma and his humor that kind of kind of sells sells you on the concept. Um, so yeah. I, I really like this film. W- what did you think about it overall? What would you say? Um, I very much enjoyed it. I would say the second and third time that I've seen it, I liked it more than the first time. I remember when I first went to the theater, I kind of walked out and I felt a little disappointed. I didn't think the jokes hit as much as they probably should have, but rewatching mm-hmm. it after some time, it's one I think that holds up pretty well. Uh, it's it's got good humor. It's they for uh, a character who seems lame and cheesy, they did a really good job <laughs> of making him someone fairly relatable, and particularly yeah. someone who oh, yeah. uh, like the new millennials can root for as well. Yeah, I think Paul Rudd went a, a long way in, in, in doing that, making relatable. I thought that was perfect casting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was interesting casting. I remember when Edgar Wright was still attached to the project, and he, I would have loved that. Uh, he had already stated by that point that they were going to go with Scott Lang as the primary uh, and a protagonist of the film. And see, that, that kind of got me a little bit, but once they said that it was going to be like a comedy and they, Paul Rudd was going to be the lead, I kind of saw the direction that they were going. Mm. Um, I, I was. I remember. I was very disappointed when I heard that the the main character was not going to be Hank Pym, um, yeah. just because I, yeah, I've, I've always felt like 
like Pam has gotten like the short end of the stick when it comes to <laughs> characterization in the comics. Like That's he's cool. always defined by his insecurities and his guilt and everything like that. But and he's like a smart guy. Wife beating. Wife beating. Yeah, yes, he's he kind of a, a bastard. Beater. Yeah, well, they they all have their so flaws I, because they're Marvel. Makes them good. <laughs> but yeah, I think they went overboard with his flaws and like like yeah, like all the Marvel characters have that. flaws. But with this one, they kind of. And, and right now he's he's a villain. You know he like merged with Ultron in the comics, and now he pretty much is Ultron. And Scott Lang, you know, is is the you know official Ant Man. There's not two of them anymore or anything. Um, okay. But I I like the way they portrayed Hank Pym in this film as kind of like a mentor, and how they set it up with with Hank and Janet being like these these cool like '60s Cold War superhero <laughs> spies. That, that was just a brilliant idea, I think. Um, yeah. And I was also disappointed when they were talking about, uh, or uh, when they first announced that Scott Lang, I was like, who the hell is Scott Lang? <laughs> Lang. <laughs> Lang. I, I had no idea who he was. Like, I'd never read a comic with him or anything yeah. like that. So, uh, yeah, I was glad to see uh, that Hank Pym was, was in there in some way. And that he was an asshole, yeah. in a way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, he did, they, did, they made that, uh, they showed his violence, which I think was a good... Uh, kind of throwback to the people who know that he beat Janet. Uh, just kind of like, oh yeah, you yeah. know he can get set off, which they showed multiple times throughout the film. That's yeah. right. They like that's what they started off with. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> where they introduced the character. Yeah, go- slamming some other guy's face right into yes. the table. Yeah, going, like, oh! going to the 1989 Shit. opening that starts the film. Um, I thought they, I loved that scene. I wasn't expecting it. It was like the first Marvel film to go with the, like the cold open, mm-hmm. and uh, they're at the the Triskelion that's just being built and. And, uh, you know, it was cool to see Peggy Carter yeah. and, and Howard Stark there and everything like that. And, and I think the special effects that they did for Michael Douglas were yeah. just phenomenal. Yes. I think it was the same company that did the special effects for Captain America, the, the first okay. one. It's for the Benjamin Steve. Yeah, that's Skinny Steve, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought they did a fantastic job. And, you know, you could tell that it's a computer, but, like, if you freeze frame, um, the, if you go still by still... It looks flawless, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I wonder if they'll do another flashback scene in the next movie with him and Janet or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Or do you want to see it? It'd be interesting to see some of the Hank and Janet's dynamic and see how that relates to Scott and Hope's dynamic. If like we see some of those kind of uh, scenes that they're similar enough, besides the wife beating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Since I mean, like the movie is going to be called Ant Man and the Wasp, mm-hmm. so if it kind of jumps back and forth between you know, the 60s and today, I think that, and showing like the different generations of Ant-Man and the Wasp, that might be a little bit cool. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually getting into a Twitter discussion like uh, last week, I think it was, over, uh, I guess Sharon Stone has this mystery Marvel role and no one's sure what it is. I think it's going to be the Wasp. I think it's going to be Janet. I, re- I really hmm. hope it is. It, it would be perfect casting. Well, basic instinct casting. Yeah. And yeah. then she flashes her vagina and stabs somebody with a nice pick. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, no, I heard that uh, Michael Douglas was maybe thinking that Catherine Zeta-Jones might make a good wasp. And I think she kind of could look like uh, Hope's mother, yeah, Evangeline Lilly, mm-hmm. I think. I can see, I that. I can see yeah. that more than Sharon Stone, I think. Yeah, I can see that. So, so yeah, the, the opening sequence, uh, pretty cool. It goes right after uh, the, the Marvel... Uh, title card into the the prison fight, uh, which I thought did a fantastic job of of setting up the humor in the film because like the first shot is his, of of uh, Scott Lang being all serious and and you're still not quite sure what type of movie this is if this is like a, a serious film especially with the previous scene how kind of intense it was but then like you know they get into the prison fight and and he was like man you guys have the weirdest goodbye rituals mm-hmm. and then we meet Luis and it, it kind of sets up the humor for the film I, I love Luis as a character yeah. I think he should be in every film yeah uh, Michael, every Michael Pena film is- kills it um and they do a fantastic job of doing kind of like that bait and switch comedy throughout the entire movie it's just good stuff yeah yeah so the next humorous scene is he's at Baskin Robbins, and actually I do this every. I've only been to Baskin Robbins like twice since this movie came out, though. But each time I'm like, "Yeah, I'll take hamburger," <laughs> just to see if they get it. And they're like, "No, we don't. Ha- we ha- we have ice cream." I'm like, "I'll just take whatever's hot and fresh." <laughs> and then some some of them get it, and some of them don't. <laughs> I love that scene. Um, didn't wasn't the story that Paul Rudd helped write the script for this film? Like he yeah, he was credited as a writer. Yeah, he was credited as a writer. Um, uh, you could tell like a lot of his kind of like 
the Anchorman style like ad lib type humor kind of mm-hmm. made it into this. Like with that whole scene where he gets fired too. If you look at the gag reel, that scene where he gets fired goes on for much mm-hmm. longer, and there's a mm-hmm. ton of jokes in there. And he's like, oh yeah, if you want, uh, the boss is like, if you want, you can take like you know a couple gallons of ice cream, <laughs> but uh, you're still fired. And he's like. I'd expect that shit from a Cold Stone Creamery. <laughs> it's nice. pretty funny. Very nice. Yeah, I thought the whole scene was good though. And then we, we, he goes to his apartment where we first meet the rest of the gang. Um, I thought I don't know that what the name of the actor is. The Russian guy. Yeah. Oh, he was in The Dark Knight. Uh, Dismalchin, like Dave Dismalchin, something like that. Hmm. I thought his his Russian accent was a little bit over the top, but I thought T.I. was hilarious. Uh, never seen T.I. in a movie before, but he had some pretty good comedic timing. Yeah, absolutely. And then from there, we go to Pimp Tech, where we see Darren Cross and Hope for the first time. Um, kind of like with how we don't get to see Hank Pym in action and Janet in action, um, uh, I was disappointed. Actually, I should say I was. I was disappointed that we don't get to see Jan- Janet as the Wasp. Um, Hope Van Dyne, mm-hmm. their daughter, was kind of like their. He, he, she was their daughter in like an alternate universe. I think it was like MC V two universe or something like that. Um, so it was interesting how they made her, her the Wasp in this movie. Um, I don't know. I, I I think Evangeline Lilly looks a lot like Janet Van Dyne from the comics, though. Yeah. So that's always good to you know. Yeah, they, she had like the haircut down. Uh, she's got a good look. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, she's pretty good. And we, we we meet Darren Cross for the first time, the bad guy. Yeah. What did you What did you guys think of the, of Darren Cross? Uh, I thought <laughs> at first he was kind of a a weak villain. Um, he it just he's crazy out of nowhere. They kind of they then they piece things together. Like it takes some time because. They explain, oh, it's his own particles that he's making screws up his own brain, and that's kind of what's been leading him down this crazy path that we get to much later in the film. But at how first, convenient? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't feel he was very well motivated as a villain early on. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, I ended up. I mean, I, lo- I love the battle scene later, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But uh, he, he was an iffy villain. I mean, he wasn't anything special. He's kind of reminded me of. Um, Oh, uh, the same kind of uh, motivation Jeff Bridges had in uh, oh, Obadiah Stane. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just kind of like yeah. oh, the other guy who wants that tech villain, and that's it. Yeah, he he had some kind of motivation as far as like yeah he he resented his mentor or yeah. because for abandoning him or something. He needed like that. that daddy it, figure for sure. Yeah. It was kind of weak motivation. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't relatable at Agreed. all. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I do think they somewhat salvaged it with, like, the crazy pin particle exposure. Um, somewhat. But I do think that his performance, I forgot the actor's name. Carrie Stoll, I think. Carrie Stoll. Corey. We'll just go, Corey Stoll. We'll go with that. Um, I think he's a good actor. Like, he has this, he does this weird thing where you can't really read him. Like, um, I think... Uh, the, the prime example where it kind of clicked for me that he was doing this was near the end of the film where he says, how do I look? But like before that, he has just like this really intense stare and you can't quite figure out where he's going with it. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think, and like just small moments where he like puts his hand on a guy's shoulder or something like that, where he's like, eh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, uh, I think it has, it, for some reason, it, he brings a little bit more intensity to it than you would otherwise suspect, I think, than somebody else could, could pull off. I don't know. I think he does a good job for what he's given. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. give him a C minus. <laughs> I don't know. It was just, yeah. it was so generic. In I mean, I don't, I really, okay, I like the film, but it's so, I was telling you this earlier, this is like the PSL of comic book films. It's so like just hashtag basic <laughs> same thing with the villain it, you know it just continu- it doesn't do anything to buck marvel's trend of having these kind of like mediocre villains that are just like there to a you know they're like the dark mirror image of the hero they have the same powers it's old mm-hmm. it felt really old by the time i saw this i didn't see this in theaters no mm-hmm. i saw this a long time after um 
And yeah, I think I would have been more disappointed seeing it in the theater. Um, just because like, I, I feel like I would have been watching it like and just thinking, man, Edgar Wright would have made a much better film, much less generic film. Yeah, I can't, um, can't disagree with that. Edgar Wright would have killed it. Um, yeah. That I, I mean, even, yeah, just rewatching this uh, not too long ago, I, I just, I was begging, like, oh, they were try they tried some director stuff that looked Edgar Wright ish, but it just wasn't mm-hmm. there. And mm-hmm. if if he would have stayed on, if he could have made that work, it would have been it would have been fantastic. Yeah, I, I, you have to wonder, like, what would it have been, mm-hmm. like, because like Ant Man, I think the like, action scenes would have been similar. I think the. Uh, the non-action scenes, everything yeah. else, like the exposition, they would have been a little bit more, uh, they would have been a little bit well, punchier, I think. They would, yes, he would have done a lot more visuals to uh, spice up the transitions, to done, yeah. he does a, a fantastic job of not just saying the exposition and telling the audience what's happening, which is a problem that they had in this film, just kind of, they... Telling, they, not showing. Yeah, yeah. exactly, and, and Edgar Wright shows, like we, Paul Rudd says... Man, I've got a master's in mechanical engineering, and like I was like, oh, yeah. now it clicks. As opposed to like Edgar Wright or other more inventive directors would like show us and lead us, so we figure it out ourselves, and then it all comes together, and that's better for us as audience. As opposed to yeah. Marvel has this problem, and not just Marvel, but a lot of movies nowadays have this problem of just telling the audience everything and then saying, all right, let's get into the action right away. Um, yeah. As opposed to the buildup and showing that, which uh, really is part of the journey and much better for the audience in general. Right. Yeah, definitely. Edgar Wright's film definitely would not have been on brand, on the Marvel brand. No. Um, which is kind of sad. I feel, makes me feel bad for the Marvel brand that they Beat a cat. <laughs> Sorry. Beat no. a cat. <laughs> it's, uh, it's becoming a famous cat and it's keeps <laughs> making its way into the podcast. Uh, er- Every unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> what were you saying? Um, I forget what I was talking. He, about. It would end up in formulaic. You keep t- oh, okay. So here's the thing: you, you keep talking about Mar- Marvel's formula, and yeah. you, you said you called it the you called Ant Man the pumpkin spice latte of of superhero films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I won't disagree with that because I, I think that this this film is certainly on brand and 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 kind of formulaic, even though it's unique in that it's somewhat of a heist film, um, but. Here's the thing. I like pumpkin spice lattes, man. Right. They're they're good. <laughs> There's a reason they're so popular. It's because they're good. I think this, this like you can harp on this movie for being formulaic or what, but there's gonna be a time when DC movies are for, for, are formulaic. There just there, has not there, been enough of them. I yet. think they're already formulaic. I think they've got problems, uh, and it's well. I mean, Suicide Squad was different, but it wasn't better. Uh, it had it was it was like a marketing team obviously chopped up the dark crappy movie to make it seem cool like Deadpool and it didn't work. But that's right. uh, that's a whole other discussion, but Oh, what, what film? <laughs> uh, Suicide, Suicide Squad. Squad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, they yeah. they're formulaic at least at least the two Batman movies. Uh I guess they have to be to be in their same in that genre, but yeah. they uh, I don't know. I I have so many problems with DC films uh right now. Yeah, the, they both Neither studio is perfect, but yeah. I think that what Marvel has going for it, I'd rather see these somewhat formulaic films. And Doctor Strange, I, I think we also said was was fairly formulaic. Yes, but yeah. I'd rather see those type of films. But at least they remain, you know, true to the character and and tell a somewhat decent story, um, and and are at least as good as they should be. They mm-hmm. they they're not they don't necessarily strive to be you know like the next Dark Knight or anything like that. Except for maybe I think Civil War. I think was was fantastic in both fronts and that it, it was good and, and non-formulaic but I, i'd rather see this than than you know the shit storm that's helping happen over at dc right now mm-hmm. i guess <laughs> if you like that sort of thing i don't know <laughs> uh, so actually okay so b- b- back to the film yeah. uh the the yellow jacket presentation um it, that struck me as odd too. Remember when I, they first announced that the villain was going to be Yellow Jacket? Because Yellow Jacket was always my favorite incarnation of the Hank Pym character. Like, yeah. I didn't like the name Ant Man because I was like, but he can grow giant. And mm-hmm. I didn't like the name Giant Man because I was like, but he can shrink to the size of an ant. And, you know, for a lot of Hank Pym's history, he was always like stuck in, in either only being able to shrink or only being able to grow. But Yellow Jacket, the character Yellow Jacket, was able to do both. 
And I thought like his name kind of matched up with the Wasps very well, so they looked more like a team. Yellow Jacket was always my favorite version of this character. So when they announced that he was going to be the bad guy, I was like, okay, that makes sense because Hank Pym was crazy when he was the Yellow Jacket character. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, they, they did a reincarnation uh, when, in the comics, though, when they introduced Darren Cross as like a Yellow Jacket villain. I think, wasn't it in the 80s or something like that? They, or was it much much mm, later? But it was, it was much was, later. Okay, it was much later. But he, yeah, Darren Cross eventually did become Yellow Jacket, and this was after uh, Hank Pym was out of the picture, and, and it was against Scott Lang. So there's, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it did happen in the comics. But, but yeah, so I, I, I thought but the design. I, I agree. I mean, when I think of Yellow Jacket, I absolutely think of Hank Pym right away. I don't think of the villain Darren Cross. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was yeah. disappointing as well when when I first heard about it. Yeah, I have to say though, the design of the costume, I think is probably one of my favorite villain designs out of any... or prob- It probably is my favorite uh, villain design out of all the films, Marvel films. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like, when I saw that video presentation of, like, what the yellow jacket could do, just, like, snipe, assassin, badassery, <laughs> I was like, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> I want that. Yeah, it looked... It, they did a good job of making it look, like, really kind of shit your pants scary like if it was real like with the whole oh, swarm of the yellow jackets you, and everything you definitely felt the stakes in this film which like is more than i could say for like uh even doctor strange like i was terrified of like this yellow jacket thing like becoming a reality in the film and i knew they had mm-hmm. to stop it so i appreciated that especially i think what was how going uh, howard stark's first line was um, he just kicked your ass full size. You want to know what it's like when you, when you can't see him coming. And I was like, that's the appeal of Ant Man. You can't see him coming. Yeah. He's a badass. He's a, he's a Absolutely. bigger badass than anybody else thought he would be. Yeah. So, in your face, all you naysayers, like, <laughs> I won't name names, but I know people. <laughs> and you're probably listening to this podcast. Yeah. I want so, you to know that I know. They did a fantastic <laughs> job of uh, kind of, I guess, showing the crazy and then also showing the stakes that uh, Yellow Jacket was willing to kill anyone and every, anything. Like, they killed a baby lamb. Like, holy shit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Who no. the fuck does that? Exactly. Oh, no. I th- you didn't think that uh, that was going to happen. <laughs> they're like, should we make it a dog? They're like, are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I thought it was uh, uh, wonderfully uh, humorous and dark when he zapped the guy in the bathroom. Yeah. And he, like, turned into that little splotch of, like, strawberry yeah. jam. Kinda, <laughs> and then he, like, kind of, like, wiped him up with, like, a paper towel and, like, chucked it in the, mm-hmm. in the yeah. husband. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I think he, those like little small moments kind of helped with the development of his character to show how, how mm-hmm. evil he was. Um, so, uh, before the bathroom scene, uh, you have the birthday scene, which first, you know, w- which sets up the whole motivation for, for Scott, which is his daughter and how his, you know, he just got a jail. It's hard for him to, to provide for his daughter and see her and, and, uh. After he figures out that, you know, he, he's not going to be able to... It's going to take a really long time for him to even be able to see his daughter. He decides to, to go off of Luis's tip and, 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 and uh, go into the old guy's safe. Um, th- those sequences where Luis is kind of, like, explaining what the job is through, like, you know, like a montage. A friend of a friend of a friend. Yeah, and yeah. he's, like, speaking through the voices. That was and, well done. I definitely liked that with it both, both I, times I did it. I was, I was at a wine tasting contest and I don't like reds, but there was a rosé there there to save the day. You know, it was yeah. delightful. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I, I love Luis in this film. Yeah. As I much as I like him. Michael Pena in the film, I I kind of wish, like, there was a Hispanic superhero that he could have been. Because, mm. like, he's a really good actor. I yeah. really respect him as an actor. And uh, for him to, like, sort of have to take this role as, like, a minor sub-character... Yeah. Um, it was kind of disappointing. To he did of, great in the yeah, role. He did great in the role, but great, there yeah. aren't who, too many. Who could he been? Yeah, but you could make. I mean, you know, Baron Mordo wasn't black, but he is in Doctor Strange. Very true. Uh, you it's know, very true. Nick Fury wasn't black, and until Ultimates, Ultimate Comics. Yeah, yeah but uh, you know, they could. I mean, Pena is a great actor. He definitely could have fit somewhere. I'm not sure yeah. where, but he could have been. Um, where are we? So okay, so the, they're they're doing the job. And uh, uh, I think they did a uh, they did a good job of showing um, Scott's resourcefulness and ingenuity with how he like you yeah. know did, went past the thumbprint lock. Very MacGyver. And, uh, very MacGyver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you know, like getting the the door the safe of the the door of the safe off and everything like that. Um, 
I thought, uh, I thought that was his biggest kind of character building moment right there. Um, because it also showed that, you know, when he did that little, not parkour move, but it wasn't quite parkour, but it, you know, it was athletic. Like they show yeah. that he can be athletic and, and you kind of see him as, uh, as a superhero a little bit in this moment, because before you, you couldn't, I don't know. I didn't know if he was really quite selling the fact that he could be this heroic character. So yeah. I thought that was pretty good. I agree. After that, it's the first time he shrinks. He takes the suit back to the to his restroom, and he's kind of tinkering with it, um, part of the electronics, or I think he's setting up the electronics in the suit, which, uh, and he puts it on, and we see him shrink for the first time. Did you see this movie in 3D, Spies? Uh, the first, no, I don't think I did. Yeah. How I many times remember. did you see it in theater? I only saw it in theater once, uh, and then I've seen it once or twice outside it at home. Um, I have to say, I think even more than Doctor Strange, this, uh, I, I, and I've said before, I, I don't like 3D. I, I'm against it. Tickets are too expensive, the film is too mm-hmm. dark, and there's not enough depth, and I kind of lose sight of it after a while. But every time this film went into those macro shots, where, like, the depth of field felt like it was a lot closer, and then all of a sudden, like, you're looking football fields away, I thought that was amazing. This film was really good in 3D. Um, I wish there was some way I could see it in 3D again, but I don't have like a 3D screen or anything like that. Wait, how many times did you see it in theater? Me? Uh, three times. I saw it three times in theater. Jeez. Once in 3D. Too much. There too was much. also a cool thing that this film did where they would show like the, the establishing shot and then all of a sudden it would like like zoom in really quick into yeah. like the, the the macro level into like so you could like see subatomic stuff like that. Um, the fact, like, like the camera was able to shrink really quick on a dime, it seemed like, and, and that was a really cool effect in 3D because it was all, it was just the immediacy of where this room is actually so much bigger than it was a half a second ago. Um, but I really love this first shrinking scene, um, and the way, you know, with the water and all the little details in the house. Um, I I thought it was probably one of the most fun moments of the film for me. I think it's. One of my favorite scenes of this film. I want to know what kind of neighbors he had, uh, like on the floor below him, where they were like it was like a nonstop rave, twenty four seven. I mean, it was for it made for a cool visual when he was spinning on the record and like, yeah. And then he was down on the floor and like they were like almost it looked like they were gonna step on him. Yeah, which he, shouldn't he, have hurt him at all, uh, knowing no, no. you know that he's you know more densely packed and just as strong as and as regular as any human. But it definitely, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a fun scene for sure. That's true. I didn't think about that. If, I mean, it shouldn't have hurt if him. You got it's just like you barely on. stepped on. And it's, or it's like someone accidentally steps on you barely this little bit, I feel. Because he's supposed to be just as strong, if not more dense as a person. So it should have hurt him less, honestly. Right. True. Right. But, but I guess I mean, he didn't, you know, he, he didn't you're know not, that you're not, you're not, Exactly. You're not, you know, the audience isn't thinking about that. I, I was thinking about that. The right. physics were way off in that scene, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, like, the physics in general are off because, yeah. like, in the comics, they explain how he can like shunt his mass, so mm-hmm. he can like be like his normal density at, from from his full size and miniature form, or he can be as light as a feather, you know. But yeah. they, it, un, but also like in, in the in the film in the comics rather, they don't explain it as decreasing the atomic relative distance between mm-hmm. atoms. No, they explain it as like just this like magical subatomic particle that lets you shrink. Because yeah. science. Because yeah. science. <laughs> uh, so how he becomes like giant man, like in Civil War, I have no idea. Because I'd assume that if you increase the, the distance yeah. between atoms, you don't grow big, you just become less dense. You just yeah. become intangible. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Science. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, uh, so fr- so from, from the rave scene, he goes into to the, uh, the, the vacuum and then he goes into, he meets the rat and then he like, he jumps off the, the, the spring loaded mousetrap and falls outside and everything like all that reminded me so much of honey i shrunk the kids yes. kind of thing. yeah there's like a, all totally a lot of that. like so many different like environments in one quick kind of scene um from like you and you you see legos close up you get to see animals close up uh you know he's on a record player just like all these different like little snippets uh of of just cool shots i think i i, I think it did yeah. a good job of of setting up that, yeah. that uh, uh, the excitement, they had shrinking. A, a lot of those shots of those, yeah, that small world that reminded me of Honey I Was Trunk of the Kids, which re- then reminded me of like I think it was Universal Studios that used to have a like a 
Honey, I Shrunk the Kids like theme park little area that, that everything was oh, huge. Really? Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I really hope Marvel does something exactly the same, or Disney does the exact same in their Marvel park that they're building out at Disneyland. I don't think they will, but that would be really cool if you have like a little Ant Man world that's like everything is huge. That would be awesome. Yeah. Or if they have like animatronic ants out there. Yeah. So j- jumping ahead in the movie, he I would, would freak out and run the other direction. <laughs> like no. <laughs> J- jumping ahead in the movie, he, he, he returns the suit, gets captured, goes back to jail, meets Hank for the first time, uh, escapes from jail, and that's when we first see the, the giant ants. And I think uh, up until that point, I wasn't 100% sure how it was gonna, they were going to sell the ants, if it was going to work. Um, but when, you, when like, you hear the helicopter sound... Mm-hmm. And and the, the the carpenter when Anthony lands for the first time when you see him, I'm like I'm totally on board with this. That, that really reminded me of Honey I Shrunk the Kids. If yeah. you remember the ant scene from that movie, oh yeah, I was like yeah. I just love giant ants. <laughs> like the the concept of them yeah. being used as like transportation and things like that is so cool to me. Uh, they're such weird looking creatures, but fascinating. I think mm-hmm. um, that's right. He was like using the ants to like shield the camera lens. Yeah, I yeah. About that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The whole I don't know, the whole science behind how I control the ants, you know, sending out electromagnetic pulse to stimulate their olfactory nerve centers. That's bullshit. Yeah, it's a little... Especially <laughs> from, mean, like, yeah. such a... From such a distance like that, it was kind of, it's kind of weird, but, uh, so, you, yeah. You, you just, don't you know, jump into Go. the world of the movie and just, yeah, exactly, you're on the ride by that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, after... Uh, he escapes from jail, go to Pim's house, and this is all, you know, the big, the whole second act of this film is non-stop exposition, pretty much. Um, But, uh, I think, if anybody could do it well, I think it's Michael Douglas. I think he did a good job of of explaining everything, even though it it was a lot of telling and not showing. Everything had to be explained. Um, But the line where, like, he was like, I'm done stealing, breaking into people's houses and stealing (laughs) shit. What do you want me to do? He's like, I want you to break in some place and steal some shit. Yeah. And kind of set up the heist <laughs> for the film. I, I thought it was novel. Yeah, I thought it was pretty yeah. good. I, yeah. I never got the sense, really, that this was a heist film. Like, the same, like, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. like the Italian job or something like that. Uh, this was much more of a superhero film. I, yeah. I honestly never felt heist. Exactly. I mean, the, the Italian job, the climax is the job. It's the actual heist. Here, the uh, the climax was the battle, um, and it wasn't right. even a, really a heist. It was just to blow up all the information and get rid of the suit. It was never, like, really... Uh, they even say it. This was never just a heist. It so. was never just a heist. Did you think you could save the world of the heist? I think we went to that, like, in a previous podcast, how, like, Marvel tries to, like, uh, put their superhero films in other genres, but they're, mm-hmm. like, they can never really be in that genre because... Because of the climax. Because yeah. the climax always has to be the superhero battle. I think the Winter Soldier is the exception to that. I think that mm-hmm. was equal parts superhero, equal parts thriller. S- spy. Spy thriller. Spy yeah. thriller. Yeah. Which is maybe one of the reasons why I love that movie so much. But yeah, yeah. this, this while, while, kind of, while it often gets classified uh, by marketing as a heist film, I think it's only marginally so. It has heist elements in it, but mm-hmm. it is a yeah. superhero film. Yeah. yeah. Um, that montage where they're training him, I thought was was pretty good as well. Um, where they're they're training him how to shrink, and and like those scenes in the ant hills where like we, you learn like the different types of ants that he'll be working with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That was awesome. Like and like how he would get freaked out and then like they'd have like that Bugs Bunny moment kind of thing. I thought that was hilarious. I thought it was th- those were some of the best gags in the film. Yeah. I think, but it was just cool to see all the different ants. Like he had those like those el- electrical ants or mm-hmm. they they like conduct electricity. There was the uh, the carpenter flying thread. ants. The, There's that yeah the carpenter the, the, the pain the, the pain really the bite yeah on the yeah. Schmidt scale highest on the Clernera Clern Clern yeah. whatever <laughs> exactly. it's called yeah um, and, and then ants. there were the ones that could like create the like the constructs like the bridges yeah. and they could like float and yeah. things like that ants are cool man <laughs> like I think after this like anytime like I saw an ant. I think still to this day, anytime I see an ant, I'm like, oh, Ant-Man. Yeah. So you can thank Look, Marvel for a whole bunch of uh, youngsters getting into entomology, and they're going to broaden that science completely. <laughs> oh, definitely. Like, I remember as a kid, like, anytime I saw an ant hill, I'd, like, like mess it up with my shoe. I'd be like, go away, ants. <laughs> but now, like, like, I think if the adult me saw, like, the little kid me doing that, 
you know, he'd, he'd like grab him by the collar and be like, don't do that, you little shit. Those answer our friends. <laughs> so I think the, the, the funniest, like this whole, the whole training montage was just hilarious and it was really well done. But like, even before that, like when, uh, like they're sitting at the table and, uh, Hank Pym was first like giving him the, the proposition of like what their plan is and stuff like that. And he was like, you want some sugar? And he was like, sure. And the two ants like <laughs> dragging the, he's like, nah, you know I'm what? Good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Welcome. Yeah. He uh, sold it. Mm-hmm. Paul Rudd sold it for sure. Um, and, and I thought the, um, they, they kind of went into a little bit about how he's kind of tinkling, tinkering with the electricity uh, or the electrical components of the suit. And I, I thought that was another funny scene where he's like, you know, this regular regulator is holding you back, man. And he's like, don't mess with the regulator. You'll shrink for all eternity. And he's like, you know what? Regulator's good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, tons of those bait and switch uh, jokes that, you know, you thought they're going to like, okay, it's a normal kind of conversation here. And then boom, right onto the joke. Uh, just <laughs> Paul Rudd, his timing and uh, his deliveries are perfect. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it kind of happened again uh, another uh, a third time when Hank finally came clean with Hope on what happened to her yes. mother. Yeah, and really like that whole that whole uh, monologue was so ridiculous. Like it was supposed to be like this emotional moment, but he's like, "Your mom shrunk between the molecules." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Holy crap, that's cheesy as hell!" <laughs> but like they really they, like the music was all sentimental and like they were crying and they were hugging and everything like that. But I think like what avoided it from becoming just absolutely horrible was Paul Rudd's moment right after that. He was like, "Wow, you guys are breaking boundaries." And like things like that, he was like, "This is just like a great moment." And he's like, "Oh, I ruined it, didn't I?" He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "I'm gonna go get some coffee." Like I, I think it kind of helped out how mm-hmm. cheesy that moment could have been, but that flashback scene, that was cool, yeah. was really cool. Seeing the wasp, yeah, she's such a cool visual character, and she was flying in and and um. What did, what what did I notice? Oh. When he was trying to break into that titanium Russian missile, he had like these uh these like arm. It looked like a, yeah, like, like a propane torch yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that he was try, exactly trying to cut into the the metal, whatever it yeah. was. Yeah, it makes me think that um, since in the comics, the wasp can shoot these like electric blasts. These mm-hmm. the wasp bio, stains. bio whatever they're yeah bio bioelectric. Yeah, yeah. So, so that doesn't really make sense because she's able to channel them through her own body. But I think I, if you go the tech route and have like these little wrist mounted like. Uh, electric beam shooter things. I think that's probably the way they'll go, kind of similar to what he had in this in this film as he was trying mm-hmm. to cut through the titanium. Yeah. Makes you that think, makes sense. why didn't he put wings on his own suit? Like, I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> I've always wondered that's that. Like, why I like comics. That's, yeah. that's why I like Yellow Jacket, man. Yeah. Yellow Jacket can yeah. fly. Like, Ant-Man yeah, without Jacket wings. It's weird. Like, what's the yeah. point? Like, you've had that technology the entire time. Why not add it to your own suit? It just doesn't make Seriously. sense. Seriously. I'm interested in... They'll probably explain that in the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. I'm interested in seeing what, what they'll say about it. But yeah, like, wings would be super helpful. You don't if, have to rely you know, on Antony the entire time. Exactly. Uh, right. oh, yeah. But then it yeah, sets up that whole thing. They're probably just going to make, you know, Janet, like, a really smart engineer or something, and the wings were her idea, or yeah. she didn't share. I don't know. Did you... She did you had th- the patent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys think that uh, any, like, between the scene where he's explaining to Hope what happened to Janet or when, you know, the, the car scene where Scott and, and Hope are, are talking about the father, do you guys think any of that hel- held any um, emotional weight like it was intended to? How effective do you think it was? Mm, semi-effective, uh, I, personally. Uh, I mean, the, the, the film didn't have too many deep scenes yet, so just those couple ones that were in there, and they were also mm-hmm. immediately negated with the comedy uh mm-hmm. they, yeah they they didn't hit me hard but they were i think necessary to show a little bit of the you know the more that human side to, to hank pym that we didn't get a lot you know most yeah. of the, most of the time early on i was like you're an asshole i don't like you hank just give the suit to your daughter because she's a badass and then mm-hmm. yeah. well, i don't even need scott lang but that kind of showed a little bit of the human side as to why his motivation was to get the expendable Scott Lang as opposed to possibly losing his daughter as well. 
Um, yeah. So I think those those couple scenes were important. I don't think they hit the audience very hard, but I think they were very good for the storytelling. Yeah, I, as, I as a father, I, I totally understood the motivation for why Hank didn't want his daughter to do that. You know, he just got this random expendable guy, really. Um, yeah, and and really, that's how that's how Scott and Hank first initially bonded. Because like at first, Scott was so you know confounded by everything that was going on and everything that was being told to him. But it wasn't until like after that scene where Hope comes in and then like Hank yells at her and she like runs off and everything, and uh, they kind of have their first bonding moment, which is really bonding over their daughters. Because that's when when Michael Douglas or when when Hank starts talking to him, you know, you know. I'm doing this for my daughter. You should do this for your daughter. Things like that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I remember like even before I saw the film, like seeing a lot of like commentary online from like angry feminists who were upset just by the idea that uh, hope wasn't uh, chosen by her father to, mm-hmm. to, to perform the job because she was capable in every way, more than capable. Yeah. So, they did cut out an interesting deleted scene during the training montage that kind of hammered home why it was better for Scott to do it. In that, while while Hope had a lot of skills um, to complete the job, he was better at breaking through security systems. Basically, is what it explained. Like he was able to mm. bypass this key code um, that was like changing the the password was changing like every minute or so, but he was able to get through it through through his what he called an idiot. He called him an idiot savant kind of thing. That's something that that Hope wasn't quite able to do. But I mean, like, as far as, like, the the feminism of the film goes, yeah, it would have been cool to see her as the Wasp because she did seem equally as capable. And she was able to kick his ass, you know. She was a good fighter. I think they they compensated. I think they really showed that she was a a vital component of the plan itself. Yeah. Although she couldn't, you know, put on a superhero suit and everything. She was still Mm. important. Yeah. I mean, I hope, uh, you know, obviously she's not the damsel in distress. Uh, She's going to be the Wasp in the next movie. But yeah. I hope I hope she doesn't kind of they're not regulating her to a sidekickish role. I hope she is is equally badass, and they make sure that they you know heighten her to his level uh, in that next film because she deserves it. She's pretty. She's pretty. Obviously, she's got all those skills needed. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What comes out first, Captain Marvel or Ant Man and the Wasp? Um, yeah. Captain Marvel. I think so. Okay. I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um. So. This takes us to the Falcon fight at the Avengers compound. That was awesome. This this was yeah. like, like every like some of my favorite comics are like when like uh, another superhero like guest spots in that issue and they end oh, up yeah. fighting or like having a disagreement or something like that. I, I love those character interactions. I thought it was so comic booky and so awesome. Really, the fact that Falcon guest spot did a guest spot in this movie and they they fought and like it was a good fight. And, like it like it, it made sense for the most part. And it kind of showed how, how cool they both were. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that scene. Yeah. I say that about a lot of these scenes. Yeah. I love that scene, though. <laughs> yeah, it was a very yeah, good I scene. That... It had great comedy at the end. Uh, yeah, I think it definitely brought... Fal- I mean, Falcon, you kind of liked him. You knew he was kind of cool. But like, I think this, this helped his character uh, in the cinematic universe as well. For sure. I felt like uh, he, was, he did cooler things in this brief moment... Just like in terms of like cool superhero badassery gadgets and stuff like that, than he did in the Winter Soldier. Yeah. Um, with like his like uh, like heads up display and stuff like that. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, because this time he had the the Stark tech and stuff like that. And in the comics, like Falcon has really good vision. He could see through the eyes of his pet Falcon. Yeah. But it's like magic. Red Red but like tech. yeah, so like this yeah, instead of like it being like supernatural or whatever, it's tech and the fact that he was able to see ant-man i was like yes of course yes that's exactly how it was in the comics he would be able to see ant-man because mm-hmm. he can see really well so i thought that was uh that was good yeah the fact that he was able to hold his own against an avenger i think also established his hero cred a little bit uh, and i think it showed the the credibility of the ant-man suit in general just like yeah it's it's oh sure uh, you someone you can beat someone like falcon with the, the lesser skills because of the element of surprise of being so tiny. And it kind of just mm-hmm. made that suit even cooler. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, and the way he was able to kind of disarm it um, by shrinking oh, down yeah. into the electronics and, and pulling it apart, mm-hmm. which he did again in Civil War. But uh, mm. I thought that was pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so after they go back to the house and, 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 and uh, uh, Darren pays a, pays a visit, Hank gets paranoid, thinks he's onto them, so they decide to bring in uh, what Hank refers to as the three wombats. Uh, so they, they uh, so they bring in Luis and, and Kurt and Dave into the job. Uh, I thought they brought in brought in some some more humor. Yeah, humor, more humor is always good. Um, the the funniest moment that he had that that always cracks me up was when Luis was like, "Hey, hey, man, uh, check it out. I, I got an idea. It's like blend in. I'm gonna whistle." <laughs> yeah, and he's like, "No, no whistling. Just the yeah. look on Michael Pena's face. He's like." And then yeah. he starts whistling. Exactly. The then you see it, and starts. it's exactly it's fun. <laughs> it pays off. Um, that takes us to the actual heist um, when they're in the van, and he and they decide to go through the water main, and he's like floating on that raft of ants. The music throughout this entire heist, I think, like you didn't really notice the music too much up mm. until this point, but throughout this entire scene, uh, I thought it was really well done. There were some parts that were kind of like surfer guitar, kind of like when he was surfing on the ants. Uh, yeah. And there was some like like funky, seventy stuff going on, and and like even the scene where he like he sets up, the the electric conducting ants through the servers and they fry all the servers that way. And he like for some reason he jumps on Anthony and he decides to like fly through all the electricity yeah. stuff going on. <laughs> it was kind of pointless, but the music during through that uh, was very heroic and I thought it was a pretty sweet. I don't remember so. that. What? I don't remember the music. Like, I don't. When I think of like oh. heist music, I think of like Mission Impossible. Was it like that? It had an element of that to it, yeah. Like when he was coming through the sink and they were going through the bathroom vent and everything. Although I want to know why the uh, that little tunnel to the yellow jacket suit, why was that a uh, laser, uh, why was there a laser grid <laughs> guard right yeah. there? Uh, like, I, I, yeah. I think he was uh, trying to protect it from Hank Pym. I think maybe was what he was oh. why he would have that. But as much, as, yeah. yeah, but like they, they also knew... brought Hank Pym right into the damn room. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. Um, and then we find out that Hydra's back, and mm-hmm. that whole scene kind of that that part was a little bit clunky. Um, it introduced some some good stakes when 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 uh, when Darren shot Hank. Yeah. When that happened, I actually thought Hank was gonna die. Um, just because, I don't know, because at that point, the Did torch had already been fully passed. I yeah, I yeah, didn't really need him as much anymore, but uh, it's interesting that they kept him alive. I was actually surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you have anything to say about the, the heist scene itself? Anything that stood out to you? I, th- I thought it was clever that they, you know, decided to go in through the, the water, the water main. main. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. It just gave... Uh, one more thing for uh, Scott to just like prove that he belonged on this team with like these two really like smart and capable people, just the the things he's able to come up with. Yeah, yeah, he he's smart in his own way, mm-hmm. um, and you don't ne- you don't need to have him say I have a degree in e- electrical engineering to yeah. to prove yes, that. Yes, exactly. You just <laughs> see him do it, and you get it. Yeah. Um. So the helicopter fight. Um, are we there already? We are there already. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, well, I mean, they, the, the heist goes on for a while, actually, which is a good thing because it was kind of what the whole movie was setting up. But um, Darren, he escapes with the Hydra agents. They're, they're fleeing um, with the suit, and so he has to chase him to get it back. And, man, Darren must be a really good shot to yeah. shoot Antony <laughs> out of the air. Yes. <laughs> That was kind of heartbreaking. Like I, I was like, "No, Anthony!" And it was, it was almost they, they almost did it in a very cavalier way. Like the way yeah. it was set up is that he just shot him, and he, he was like, he was like, ah, he like did yeah, that little noise. Yeah. But then like they kind of move on right away from they it. They do. It was almost, it, it was almost yeah. unnecessary. It was like almost unnecessary to kill Anthony. I agree. But I, I wanted a bigger, either a bigger death from it because how much they pushed the Anthony name. Uh, yeah. Or or he didn't need to die. Like I or he want, I wanted. I honestly thought that they were going to go with like a martyr route uh, with Anthony as opposed to yeah, he just shot out of the oh. air and then we moved on. Like he sacrifices himself. Yeah, he sacrifices that himself yeah. to save Ant Man. That would have been better. Yeah. 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 Especially since like the, yeah they did set up the relationship, especially during the training montage where he's like riding him like a horse through the grass. Yeah. And he's like feeding him water. He's like that's a good boy, Anthony. Exactly. Like and that. then yeah, they just move on from his death. Pretty. They get two like. A shot of his wing floating, and they cut back to it, and then they're like, eh, we're done. <laughs> That's all you get. 
Yeah, apparently kids were like, uh, I saw, heard, read some interviews with Peyton Reed about how like that's the first thing a lot of kids when they talk to him about the movie <laughs> say they didn't like about it. It was like you killed Anthony. <laughs> um, oh, I feel kind of heartless right now because <laughs> like I didn't feel anything. <laughs> really? I was like, eh, there's more ants in the world. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No, yeah, but uh, Peyton Reed was like, well, I mean, like, ants only have, like, a lifespan of, like, eight weeks or something like that, so mm-hmm. he's going to be dead soon anyway. <laughs> Take that little kid. Take that little yeah, kid. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That poor, yeah, never mind. I was say that <laughs> poor big uh, ant dog that they've got later, that thing's not going to last oh, too long. Yeah. That poor Cassie's going to be uh, scarred for life when it's just dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's going right. to be gross, too. That's right. Um, <laughs> So 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 the helicopter fight I, I thought actually was pretty good because it's the first time we see him in the yellow jacket suit and I, I just love that suit so much. Um and when he's like blasting, trying to hit him with his lasers to trying to hit Ant Man, and Ant Man is like jumping off the debris that's flying from the resulting blasts. I, I saw that for the first time in, in the trailer for the film. And I think that scene where he's shown like flying up toward the camera with his fist, I was like, I think Peyton Reed re- really got the character. I think he understands what makes him cool, um, and, and what makes him so so exciting and, and visually interesting. Because um, that's exactly how yeah. I want to see like an Ant Man fight, mm-hmm. where they're like going back and forth between being big and being small and doing it quickly, and there's just so much uh, chaos going on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but and when, the, the but when scene... you cut back to it, it's not that much chaos. It's a little train right. thing over like that. Was, exactly, that editing in that was awesome. Like that whole that fight sequence was fantastic. God, I've said fantastic yeah. too many times. It's uh, <laughs> whatever. It's great. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. What's cool about Ant Man is that you can have like these super epic like city leveling battles, mm-hmm. but have like the relative overall damage be significantly lower because like it happened like in a toy box or in a suitcase or something like that you know um so like like ant-man's never gonna run the risk of like pulling a man of steel or like his battles like kill thousands of people or something Mm -hmm. like that you can like Uh, have this these moments where like they're (laughs) flying through buildings and like everything's falling over but like really nothing happened (laughs) um and yeah i I like the the scene in 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 the briefcase where he's like i'm going to disintegrate you like playing disintegration by the cure it was like a little a little gag, but uh, I thought the music from uh, that song, Plain Song, actually suited the kind of spacey vibe of like everything that's flying around them. And like they, they there was like the lifesavers package, and like mm-hmm. the the green lifesaver like exploded. That was cool in three D actually, because he had like all these like little lifesaver bits that were like floating around as oh, they bet. were jumping through them. Yeah. It's like, like all the that. particles and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Actually, in three D. Every time he went small, there were always these um, like little dust motes just flying around that you could really pick up in 3D all the time. It was pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Now I kind of regret not seeing it in 3D. Yeah, so, yeah you're right, but that would have been awesome. Yeah. I like the gag at the end of, of that fight um, where he hits him into the bug zapper with the ping pong paddle. Yes, like that's exactly what you would do to a wasp uh, or a jacket <laughs> or something. And then that was like, yeah, a nice realistic moment, but that was a, had a lot of humor into it. Yeah, Ton, tons of just little small gags that you can do yeah. with Ant-Man in, in the battles. And especially, you know, he gets arrested and, and then they have the fight in Cassie's bedroom. All those gags. That's what I, the, I want to see a lot more gags. In, in the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie because I think those were some of the best parts of this movie in terms of the mm-hmm. fight. Like with the whole Thomas the Train thing. Yeah. How great yeah, was that? that was awesome. Yeah. Hilarious. Uh, yeah. I kind of wish they didn't spoil the train one in the trailer. Oh, I mean, yeah. I remember the first time yeah. I saw it in the trailer, I cracked up laughing. It's It was so good. Uh, but I think that gag itself did a great job in actually selling the film. To mm-hmm. a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. It's because it You're was such right. a good joke. Uh, and the fact that, you know, when he's, like, lifting up, like, the train tunnel itself and everything and, like, throwing <laughs> it and chucking train cars and everything like that. It's so cool. I want to be able to shrink, you guys. I wish yeah. I had that power. <laughs> um, so uh, that fight ends with uh, with kind of a callback to the flashback 
um, that Hank gave about Janet, where he has to go through the molecules to get through the titanium. Uh, and I thought that was pretty good callback, and I thought it was cool to see the microverse. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it was pretty trippy, not nearly as trippy yeah. as the Doctor Strange multiverse traveling thing, yeah. but they did show the microverse in Doctor Strange, that one of the dimensions that he went through was the microverse. Um, and it, it was like those like crystalline shapes where mm-hmm. like when you go into them and like time and space distorts itself. It did, I wonder like, if that's how they're going to get Janet back. Yeah. yeah probably. Yeah. It made me, I mean, well, watching uh, Scott go through that, it did kind of make me think like, oh, damn, if Janet had to go through this and like she's either lost in for, or forever in there or died in there, like it's, it would have been a terrifying thing. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that would have been really... That's a horrible way to go. It is yes. a horrible way to go. <laughs> Last way I want to go. <laughs> the way um, he came back was a little weird. Like, I I, I'm, I saw that coming a mile. I'm my assuming he put those, yeah. like, those the discs. Growing okay, discs. So, yeah, yeah, so the, the way it works on the comics is that, so he, Hank Pym, he isolates these Pym particles, these subatomic particles, using uh, electromagnetism. He, he's able to isolate them in these the serum that he created um uh and that that that's what he gasses himself with to shrink and grow and everything so i'm assuming that inside these discs that he throws to shrink and grow things is like a little capsule of the serum Mm -hmm. but how it applies to the regulator and how he was able to use the capsule to grow yeah don't don't think don't think about it yeah, exactly. It's, it's it, They didn't do a very good job of setting it up. It's just like, this thing makes stuff grow. I'm going to put it in my belt. I grow now. <laughs> like, it, it did a not very good. Uh, like, we all, I think, were smarter than that, and it shouldn't have worked. Like, how come he didn't grow just a little bit? He grew back to his perfect size. How did he know it was going to go right to the exact spot and not just, oh, now he's just slightly bigger but still in that mini universe? <laughs> right. It, yeah, it didn't make any sense, but... Fuck it, no. he's he's back. <laughs> yeah, like what happens if you like if you like put like a chicken wing in the regulator or something like that? <laughs> like, like, like what happens? It'll turn you into a chicken, like, and that's exactly. That. <laughs> it's like a magic regulator device kind of thing, but <laughs> so um, that that's pretty much the film. He comes back and everything's good, and and uh, he talks with. It, it seems like Hank wants to go into this subatomic realm to find Janet and. Uh, uh, we see that Hope and 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 Scott have developed this relationship, which I thought <laughs> was was an, was another great joke. Uh, mm-hmm. When when Hank finds out, he's like, "If this is <laughs> if this is happening, just just shoot me yeah, again." <laughs> exactly. And yeah, so, Paul Rudd's uh, delivery and and response of, "Why did you kiss me right there? Why did you, <laughs> you grab me and kiss me? Ah, I don't I don't understand." Just kind of walked away. <laughs> was awesome. <laughs> He's like, you, you're, Scott, you're full of shit. He's yeah. like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, but yeah, and then uh, and then he has dinner with family, and uh, and I guess everything is good there. And he gets the call from Luis that Falcon is looking for him. Yeah, uh, reaching out to him. Sets it yeah. up for, uh, yeah, in for Civil War. Yep, yeah. for Civil War, exactly. Do we um, do we think Cassie is going to have a bigger role in the next? Movie? I mean, probably not. She be- she becomes uh, a young stature. Avenger. Yeah, stature. Exactly. I don't. I don't Wait, know what? If, uh, his, yeah. uh, Scott Lang's daughter becomes stature as a young Avenger. I'm just. I don't. I mean, they're probably it's probably just like oh. a little cute thing for people. But I don't. I doubt that they'll dive into it more. That's right. Um, she she shrinks and grows. Mm-hmm. Stature. Mm. That's a weird name. Yeah, I didn't really like it too much. They should have just like there was no Ant Man at the time. They should have just called her Ant Woman. No, yeah. actually, that's horrible. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's probably why they didn't do that. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's takes us to the very end of the film. That you have the post credit sequences where you see uh, Hope's wasp costume, which I thought was pretty cool. It looks like they're not going with like actual wasp wings that are implanted into Janet's or Hope's shoulders like uh, yeah. how it is for Janet in the comics they're going with you know like um, mechanical wings that's which I think do. is the, the right way to do that mm-hmm. um, but yeah that'll be cool to see her do that in the next film and then we have the scene from Civil War at the end uh, I think end of the film overall thoughts 
really liked the film. I think it was as good as it needed to be. It didn't really push any boundaries. Um, I felt feel about this film much the same way I did Doctor Strange, um, or vice versa, and I, I give it four stars. I can see where the argument could be made for three and a half, but uh, like the three and a half movies, I have like I have a whole list and I like ranked each one where I think it is. So on the spectrum, this is four. Like the movies that I have like around three and a half are more like uh, uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron, which mm-hmm. I did like this movie more than Avenger- mm-hmm. Avengers: Age of Ultron, and um, so yeah, that's where I put it. Four stars. What about you? But it's like you're almost a reluctant mm-hmm. four stars, kind of like with Doctor Strange. Yeah, yeah. Uh... I would kind of, yeah, feel like maybe 3.9 if that was a thing, but I agree. Uh, this movie was a lot of fun. It uh, holds up by rewatching it multiple times. I think it, it actually gets better, um, you know, a little bit. It's got good jokes. They're solid. They're not like all the time laugh out loud funny, but they're they're chuckle worthy every pretty much every single time. Um, uh-huh. My companion is fantastic. I think it's a strong film. I think it's absolutely a a four star in my opinion as well four stars mm-hmm. alright so uh, Jonathan what, what did you think of it as a comic book fan it is a great Ant-Man film it's a great character film um, but I have to wonder like would people have liked this movie as much if it wasn't in the Marvel franchise I mean I wonder the same thing about like Doctor Strange it's like I, I feel like because of it, it's part of this bigger thing that people are more accepting of it and maybe more forgiving in a way. Um, hmm. I think objectively it is a solid film, like story wise, but I, I mean, I it's, think- it's four, it's four stars. It's four stars for sure. But I just don't like respect it in the fact that like, it doesn't push any boundaries. It is just, you know, it's as good as it needs to be and nothing more. I respect it for actually being a successful Ant-Man film, which mm-hmm. I don't think anybody figured yeah. this could be pulled off. Exactly. Like, uh, yeah. Marvel's been able to take these brands that people don't know or care about as much, like Guardians, like Ant-Man, and then turn them into successful uh, in- endeavors there to just keep going and, and to uh, build all of their franchises on, or other franchises on as well, so... That's why I think it's it absolutely it deserves the respect because they were able to take someone like Ant Man who is a, a lame enough character in the comic world of okay you shrink where it's like oh yeah. this is a fun movie and then I want to see more of it I want to see him in other Marvel movies now too so uh, definitely mm-hmm. a success yeah I think it's just like generic mediocre and I guess if that's what four stars is then I, yeah I guess I have to give it four stars too reluctantly. <laughs> You could give it three point five. You don't have to. Yeah, agree. you're you're allowed to not <laughs> follow us. Uh, I mean, this this the scale we're currently operating on. Like, I, I would say it's a better film than you know, like Suicide Squad or the theatrical version yeah. of Batman v Superman for sure. Mm-hmm. It may not like look as good or be as interesting to me, but uh, just story wise, I'm big on story. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's solid. So it's it's probably four. I just yeah. A reluctant for. Yeah, Way to sell out, know. Jonathan. Way to sell out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. With that, we will say goodbye to Spees. All right. All right, man. We'll, we'll talk to you later. Thanks for, uh, okay. for being on. Yeah, of course. Thank you, guys. All right. All right. All right. That was our review of Ant-Man. Uh, a lot of fun having uh, Adam Spees on the show. It's always uh, have fun to have a guest on. Yeah, we'll have to have him back again. Um, so, uh, in our, for our next episode, we will be doing a battle cast. So we'll be pitting a Marvel character versus a DC character. Um, we'd preferably like to be, make it like a Christmas themed kind of battle. Yeah. I I can't think of too many Christmas themed Marvel or DC. Looking back at the Halloween one, like it wasn't terribly Halloween themed, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Christmas themed. Who's a Christmas hero? That's, that's up for. Someone who wears red and green. I don't don't know. know. I don't know. Yeah, well, go ahead and, and, and let us know your thoughts by emailing us at dcmarvelbattlecast at gmail.com or by tweeting at us. Uh, our Twitter handle is at dcmarvelbattle. Yeah, and uh, go ahead and, and rate us. Tell your friends about us. Yeah, tell your friends about us. Um, yeah, and I guess that does it for this episode. Yep. We'll see you guys again in two weeks. Hopefully there will be more 
there will be more news next time. Hopefully a Spider-Man trailer and Justice League trailer. We said that last time, but keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, without further ado. Up, up, and a... Wait. Up, up, and away. True believer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>